Dirty Work, Inc. Season 2 By Joshua Wagner Well, 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 look who it is. Back for more, huh? Let me guess, you just had to know what happens next. Am I right? Yeah, okay. Pull that chair up and let's get started. Let's see, where'd we leave off last time? Hmm. Followed the wrong guy. New leaf didn't work. Room full of butchered people. Yada, yada, yada. Landlady. An upside down board. Abigail. Save the lady. Oh, right, right. Here we go. So, not long after Mark gave me my official dirty work ink threats, tensions kind of started to rise around the place. Looked like some of the big pieces in the game had started to move. Mark was getting real tight about it, too. What do I mean by that? Well, here's an example. Hey, hey, who's at the door? Mark hissed at me as he came stumbling down the hallway that led to the morgue. Well, he'd been using the crematorium to burn some, uh, evidence. Hell if I know, I answered with a shrug as he snatched the pistol off the plastic lawn table in the middle of the room. Did they do the right knock? He asked, lingering in front of the door. Uh, I don't know. What's the right knock again? Oh, who the fuck is it? He shouted to the person on the other side holding the muzzle of the gun just in front of the door at chest level. It's Jekyll. I know you're not pointing that ruddy gun at me again. A voice called from back outside. Shit. Sorry. Mark apologized, putting the gun down on the workbench and quickly snatched the door open to let the tall, pale, lanky guy wearing a stained white shirt inside. You just know with how things are around here lately. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Anyway, he went on, pulling a small glass vial out of his pocket. Here you are. This should work a little better this go around. He said as he passed it over to Mark, who looked real relieved to get a hold of it. Oh, wow, yeah. Thank you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Mark thanks the strange British guy. I wasn't sure what it was the guy gave him, but the first thing that came to mind was is when a heroin addict finally gets a fix they've been after. Huh, I would have thought Mark was a junkie. I thought to myself, trying to pretend to be busy with something else. So, uh, who's that now? I asked Johnny once as I walked back into the shop. Who, him? There's Dr. Jekyll. Uh, who? I repeated, looking back over my shoulder at the guy. You know, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Like in the book and all those god-awful school plays. That guy, he explained. Why is there a storybook character in the shop? I'm not too sure about the particulars. Just that the book was based on the guy and he ended up getting stiffed over royalties or something. Tippy-top not scientist, though. He does all kinds of research on the paranormal types. He told me whilst he screwed around with whatever he was screwing around with. I don't know, I wasn't really paying attention. Later that night I saw the Jekyll guy heading towards the door and I stopped in him ask. So, you was like some kind of supernatural scientist or something? When he heard me, he turned around to face me with a finger already in the air. Paranormal? I'm... Um, say again? I responded with a shake of my head. Paranormal. The only thing we can be sure about is the things natural to the reality we live in. Those rules and whatnot, we all gotta follow, man or monster. So it's paranormal, not supernatural. He explained as he leaned his tall, lanky body down to my level, which was something by itself, cause I ain't exactly a short guy. Now what about what now? Oh, uh, yeah. So, what exactly kind of stuff do you do, scientifically? Well, plainly enough, I study underpinning physics that make the paranormal possible to gain actionable knowledge that can be used to better the lives of the paranormal 
and hopefully one day everybody else. He answered with a little gleam in his eyes as he spoke to me. Wow, that's awful. What's the word? Magnemus of you? I gotta ask, why the holy hell are you hanging out with types like, well, us? I questioned in my morbid curiosity. Ain't nobody perfect, mate. He replied with a wink before pulling the door open and stepping out into the night. As I shut the door behind him, Mark was walking up to me with one of those little plastic containers he just pulled out of the mini fridge in the back of the shop. Yeah, one of the riders is coming by for a pickup. When they knock, just hand him this. He instructed, handling the clear box of human meat. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Hey, let me ask you something. How do you account for all this? You know, revenue-wise. I asked, giving a container a little shake. <laughs> you mean like taxes and laundering and shit? We don't. He answered bluntly. What? How? I shouted a little louder than I planned to. It's a legit operation. He replied, giving the butchering tables a few pats. Alright, you remember that guy you whacked not too long ago? How I told you he's one of the ones who knows about the para whatever? Well, that particular bureau or department or whatever the hell it is are perfectly aware that some of them need human meat to live. Look at this. He added, opening an envelope, pulling a piece of paper from it to show me. Hey, yo, this is some fucking government subsidy. Yep. Uncle Sam wants the joints like this up and running so we can keep them from snatching human babies out of their cribs at night. Or at least that's what they'll be led to think if we ain't around to do what we do. Mark said as he folded the paper back up and slid it back into the envelope. While he was doing that, someone started pounding on the door. You're up, Mark said once the banging died down. So I walks over to the door and pull it open. It's one of those cute girls that's always hanging around the bastard I almost whacked by accident. Not the one with the half fucked up face, the tall one with the shitty attitude and accent thick of the mind. Oh, it's you. We both said it at the same time. I didn't know you did the delivery thing too. I said, opening the door the rest of the way to hand it the container. Oh yeah, I started about a week ago. It pays pretty good if you don't mind the almost getting killed a few times a week or so. She told me as she took the meat and stashed it away in a bag. So, you're like a, what, a gangster or something? Hey, yeah, sure, you can say that. I kind of got stranded out here, and these guys was as close to what I did in New York as I could find. Mine said, leaning against the brick wall outside the alley. What do you do back home? I guess I was more of a hitman than anything else, I admitted, shifting a little bit in my place against the wall. I think that was the first time I ever said it out loud to anyone before. No, oh, I bet all the ladies are over you. Gals love a dangerous man. She said as she swung her leg over her bike. Yeah, nah. I don't imagine I had been doing it too long if I ran around using that to get laid. I answered with a shrug. Good point, she admitted. Hey, is that that tall bitch? Mark suddenly called from inside. Yeah. I'm that tall bitch. What you need? She called back as Mark walked out into the alley with us. Hey, you look kind of morally ambivalent, he said, looking her up and down. What'd you say to me putting this in your bag along with this hundred dollar bill? And when you get to where the container is going, you drop this off too and keep that bill for yourself. He asked her, waving a small wooden box and a hundred in his hand as he spoke. Yeah, sure. Stash it in the pocket over there on the side. She said, Turn her a little so she could reach the bag. Alright, off to the goblin fights. Mark sighed as he watched the girl ride off down the alley. I thought you said we was going to the goblin fights. I said as we pulled up to an apartment building we hadn't been to before. Yeah, and that's where we're going. After this. You just stay here. He explained as he popped the van door open and jogged up to the building's entrance. You're the boss, boss. I sighed, addressing my head against the glass. He interrupted me playing Othello on my burner phone whilst I was waiting. I noticed he sat down in the driver's seat with his eyes a little red. He still had a little sniffle. 
I knew it. Mark was a dopehead. Well, I'll be damned. Okay. Let's make some money somebody else made for us. He said he should turn the ignition and press the gas. You, uh, you gotta take it out of park there, boss. Shut up! I know what I gotta do. He barked at me before shifting out of park and hitting the gas again. Somehow surviving his worse than usual driving, we finally pulled up to the fights. But as soon as we got there, we could both tell something was up. We were a little late. There should have been more. People there by now. As we looked around, suddenly Danny slammed up against Mark's side of the van. Mark! You have to help! Danny, what's going on? Mark asked as calmly as a monk as he opened the door, pushing the panic and goat guy out of the way. They just showed up and started trashing the place. Two of them! Danny tried to explain as he pointed in the direction of the building. Who? Oh, fuck it. Never mind. Hopping down out of the van and strolling towards the cruddy building with both hands tucked inside the front pocket of his sweater. Yo, boss! What's going on? I shouted as I ran to catch up. What I was worried about, probably. He answered, never missing a step. As we get closer, all of a sudden, two guys wearing all white kicks open one of the steel doors of the building, sending it flying across the parking lot, and walks out into the street. Even from a distance, I could see that they had blood in their hands and speckled all across their clothes. That shit don't work for me. Mark told them both as he kept his stride and made his way. This is my turf, and nobody but nobody fucks with my turf. Then they both just started laughing at him. An action that, from my own personal experience, is something that don't get you favorable results with Mark. And just exactly what are you gonna do about it? One of them asked as the other one punched a whole ass chunk of brick from the wall next to him. But Mark just kept making his way to them. So one of them starts walking to meet him halfway, I guess. And then when the guy in white was a few steps away from Mark, bang, bang, bang. The guy stops dead in his tracks as three shots ring out from the now smoldering hold in Mark's sweater pocket. Not hesitating and still not stopping, he pulled the snub nose he had in his pocket out, pressed it against the stunned and terrified guy's forehead, and pulled the trigger. As the man dropped to the ground, Mark kept moving and was now headed straight for the one that was left. Not saying a single word, the guy turned and ran down the far alley as fast as he could, never looking back. Wow, boss, that was some man from nowhere shit. What's all this about anyway? I asked once I caught up with him. Check the underside of that one's pinky finger. He told me, pulling down at the body with the muzzle of his revolver. It's got a little wing tattooed on it. I said up to him as I investigated. The other hand got it too. Yeah, angels. That's what I was worried about. They haven't been around here in forever. Since before I even joined Dirty Work Inc. The guys who started the racket ran them out a long time ago and locked this territory down. He explained as a look of frustration made his way onto his face. Oh, hey, Los Angeles, I get it now, I mumbled to myself. Hey, Danny, help me with his body, Mark suddenly instructed. Louie, you go back to the van and get those tin snips out of the toolbox in the back. The hotel pays a decent bounty for anyone who kills an angel that don't work for them. Okay, but why the tin snips, though, I asked. We just gotta bring them both fingers with the tattoos on them as proof. He explained, and he helped Danny drag the body towards the van's direction. We'll cook the rest of them in the furnace when we get back to the shop. Get the top out, too. We'll roll him up in it. Don't want his ass leaking all over the back of our van. We ended up leaving without the money we came for. No protection, no payment for protection. Mark wasn't all too happy about it, even though he was the one who told Danny to keep it. And we had the cash from the bounty to make up for it, but he still seemed bothered by these angels sniffing around. So that's why you're being all on edge at the shop. I asked on our way back. Yeah, Abigail gave me a tip that boss was making moves again. We might run into them. Oh yeah, Abigail, I said to myself.
Now what the fuck's wrong with you? Yeah, she's glancing over at me. Huh? Oh, well, it's a long story, but the cliff notes saw that I kind of made a promise to Abigail that night when we caught up with the guy that if things don't work out with Holly, that I'd like to take her out some time or something. Except it was a spur of the moment thing because I felt really bad for her. It just seemed like the right thing to do. But ever since then, I've been thinking about it, and I don't know how the hell I'm supposed to make that work. And Mark, in an unprecedented act of empathy and compassion, looks over at me in this difficult time, and proceeded to... <laughs> you dumb fuck! <laughs> <laughs> Mark continued to laugh in my ear. So if you back out, she's gonna rip you apart like soggy toilet paper. And if you keep your word, everyone's gonna think you're some kind of pedo freak. <laughs> That's what you get for being nice, jackass. Your compassion is appreciated, I mumbled to myself, giving up on any kind of conversation and looking out at the world on the other side of the window. A little while later, we were pulling up to this crummy-looking joint with the words, Worst Hotel, flashing in dying neon lights. Hey, give me the bag with the booger hooks in it, Mark said, pointing at the glove box. So I reach in and pull out the plastic bag with the two fingers in it and hand them to him. Got one, he said to the two guys behind the front desk, slamming the body bag down on the counter. Pay up. Jeez, Pete, another one? We don't normally get this many in a month from all over the world. The shorter, chubbier one with curly red hair said to the taller one with greasy black hair that covered the top of his eyes. They both looked more like they were working at a blockbuster or something, not a hotel. Deal's a deal, I guess. The tall one replied, reaching behind the desk and producing a large billet of gold that he dropped next to the fingers with a soft metallic thud. Who? no, hey, hold on. What's this shit? What am I expected to do with this? I can't buy beer with this. First American don't fucking take gold bars. Mark complained, pushing the belay back towards the two boys. Ah, it's all one groan. Picking up the belay and setting it back behind the desk before plopping stacks of hundred dollar bills in its place on the counter. Whoa, whoa! I shouted. So you guys expect me to believe you just keep goddamn gold bars and wads of cash behind the desk like that ain't shit? You ain't worried about people coming in here and robbing your asses? Once I was done speaking, they all paused for a second before bursting out in laughter. Then Mark spoke up. You know what the biggest problem they'd have with someone trying to rob this place? No, what? Cleaning up what's left of them. If anything, said with a smirk. Remember when you first started? The people I told you to absolutely avoid fucking with under any and all conditions. Tell me, what are they wearing? He asked, pointing at the two boys behind the desk. That's when I stopped and noticed the first time what he was talking about. Black shirts with gold trim. The same clothes that Broad was wearing that had Mark and Danny shaking in their boots at the goblin fights. As I realized that, I heard something. Loud, heavy thuds that shook the floor under my feet. I turned to face the source of the noise in time to see a colossal thing duck under the doorway and into the lobby. It was huge. I'm like 6'3 and I had to look straight up to see the bottom of his chin. It was as wide as a barn and had deep orange skin that looked like you could grind metal on it. And its hair was long and red, thick as electrical cord in some places. Oh, hey, Vort, back already? Sure, the guy behind the desk spoke up to him. When the thing spoke back, all I could hear was some kind of gravelly rumbling I could feel vibrate in my chest. But the guy seemed to understand because he added, Yeah, they're all waiting for you in the living area. The orange monster just answered with a slow wave and made his way down another hall, leading away from the lobby. What the fuck was that? I yelled as he left. Another employee. The shorter guy answered casually. Now, you're asking about someone robbing us? Jesus Christ, what kind of place is that? I asked myself out loud in the van after we left. A much, much more important place than you think. Mark answered cryptically before his phone started to ring. 
Oh, hey. Speak of the devil. Literally. What's that supposed to mean? I asked, so he held up his ringing phone to show me Abigail's name on the screen. Hello, Miss Abigail. What can I do for you? Oh. oh okay. Yeah, I understand. I know the routine. Yes, ma'am. We'll get it taken care of. He spoke into the phone before hanging up with a grim look on his face. Okay, kid. I'm going to drop you off at the shop and the rest of us are going to go take care of this thing. Whoa, whoa, why are you suddenly leaving me out of things? You don't think I can handle this? I said indignantly. I know you can't handle this. What I'm about to have to do is the dirties part of the Dirty Work Inc. And I know you ain't up for it. By then I had already dug my heels in, so I wasn't taking no for an answer. Don't give me that shit. I'm not some green piss ant. And you damn sure ain't leaving me sitting at home like some kid whilst mommy and daddy do grown-up shit. Alright. You just remember that you said that in a little while when you regret your decision. Hey, what the shit? I shouted as well as drove up to an old shack of a house far out in nowhere's. Standing outside were two guys dressed in all white, same as the two from the goblin fights earlier that day. Easy. We're on neutral ground right now. They gave the tip off that brought us out of here. He explained as he pulled to a stop a few feet away from them. What the hell could be going down that has you all tender a mile around two of the guys you just went after like a badger on a crank a few hours ago? Right, look. Even in this business, there's some shit that's off limits. Completely and absolutely off limits. Most everyone agrees on that shit. When someone gets it in their head to do it anyway, well then everyone else enters into an armistice until the issue gets dealt with. You understand? He asked once he was done explaining. I think so, but what is it that- You're about to find out. Mark interrupted me as Chris and Johnny pulled up behind us, followed closely by the super agent they say is named Han in his pickup truck. Oh shit, this is about to get serious. I mumbled as Chris handed me the rifle and vest Mark gave me. I could feel the tension in the air building. The normal banter I was used to with these guys was nowhere to be found, and they all had pure murder in their eyes because they knew why they were there, and I didn't. Finally, Mark walks over to the angel guys and says something to them. Everyone in there is a vampire for sure, right? And the closest one to him answers. We were working over one of their tamer Main Street brothels across the city, and one of them tipped us off in this place, if we take it easy on him. We didn't. The guy in white said with his own scowl to match Mark's and everyone else's, you been in yet? Mark asked, to which the guy shook his head. All right then. Muscles, you sneak around back, and if any of them try to make a break for it out the rear. You Asians are good at math, right? Do some division. Don't kill him if you can avoid it. With a small nod, Han pulled out a large blade out of his case and vanished into the shadows of the alleyway beside the house without so much as a sound. By then, I was starting to get anxious. I'd never seen them so serious about anything before and working with people we had an on-site kill order for. Goddamn Mark was right. I was already regretting it. But not as much as I would. Okay, everybody on me. You two. He said pointing to the angel guys. The faster and harder that door comes off its hinges, the better. You know the right knock? They nodded and took their place on the porch in front of the door. After that, Mark ordered Johnny to cover the door with one of the angel guys who stayed back with him just in case anyone slipped past the rest of us. Once everything and everyone was in place, Mark gave the signal and put his finger in the ring of something in his hands. The two angel guys gave the door a soft knock in a certain pattern and waited for a voice to ask for a password from behind it. What's the pass? BAM! The voice was cut short as they hammered into the door and sent pieces flying into the center of the room like shrapnel. Before Mark yanked the pin on the object he'd been holding and tossed it in before ducking back behind the wall. A flashbang. The sound from the detonation even made my ears ring from outside. And that's when we all stormed in. In among the chaos, I managed to keep a level head and do what they told me to. Shoot the head, and in the short time, they're unconscious, cuff him. Two sets of hands and two sets of feet. Hands and feet, and then hands two feet after that. It was all over in seconds, but felt like forever but the figurative and literal dust finally settled as we got control over the place. 
Okay, so now can someone please tell me what's going on? I asked once Han reported from outside that he caught a couple that tried to bolt. Mark looked at me for a second and sighed as he led me over to a closed door. Abigail told you what happened to her, right? He asked in a deathly serious tone. About what she's been going through? I felt my gut tighten as I nodded and Mark pushed open the door to reveal an almost empty room with a concrete floor and tile walls. On one side was a water hose, and in the middle was a drain the floor made a gentle slope into. And on the far side was a middle-aged woman, no clothes on, huddled in the corner with a heavy chain around her neck. Then he walked me over to the next door and pushed it open. The room was the same except the woman looked to be in her early twenties, and the floor was still painted what I sure was fresh blood. Then he led me over to the next door. Inside was this girl that couldn't have been 18 yet. See the pattern? Mark asked as he looked down to the two remaining doors. No. Oh no, 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 no. Don't tell me. I whispered in a trembling voice as the ring in my ears finally started to go away. I could finally hear the muffled crying from the far door. The next thing I knew I was outside violently puking over the side of the porch into the bushes with Johnny patting me on the back. Let it out. Most of us do the same thing. You guys puked your guts out the first time too? I tried asking between wretches, but Johnny pushed me to the side and vomited right next to me. I still do. Every time. He groaned, wiping his face with a handkerchief. What can hold it together and I don't know how. He's got the worst job of it all. He added as Mark walked past both of us on the way back from the van, giving us uncharacteristic pats on the shoulders as he unwrapped the small knife with gold lines in the blade from a fold of leather. Take your time, boys. Mark said as Chris finally walked out to join us on the porch. A few minutes later, Mark was back outside, visibly paler than when he walked in. A twenty-something woman was standing next to him, wrapped in a blanket, but still looked completely petrified. One's better than last time. He said to us under his breath. So, uh, Johnny, you want to take her to get set up in the hotel? We'll take care of everything else. I'll meet you at the bar when we're done. He told Johnny, who answered with a nod, and gently led the mortified woman over to his car, opening the door so she could get in. After Johnny took off, Mark sat down in a plastic lawn chair on the porch and told me, Chris, and Muscles to drag the guys we had hot tied inside out and stuffed them into the back of the van, and then the angels would lay a hand too. What about the rest of those rooms? I asked when he didn't say anything about them. Louis, look, here's how it works. Those were vampires in some of those rooms. Some of them have been like that since before I was born. They've been going through a hell me and you can't imagine. So I give every one of them a choice. The ones that can't even make choices, whether they want to live a free life again and keep going, or would they rather call it quits for good? Most of them take the easy way out. And the one that we just left with Johnny, she's one of a thousand. Now go do what the fuck I told you to do so we can go to the bar and get fucked up, please! So I was keeping watch as the rest took the cuffs off the feet and Mark began to speak down at them. All right, gentlemen, he said with an almost theatrically official sounding voice. It is by the power vested in me by the paranormal community proper that I hereby sentence you all to the custody of Abigail Hawksworth. May God have mercy on your souls, because she sure shit won't. He muttered the last part under his breath as the captors heard the name they all got real still, an actual look of fear on their faces for the first time that night. Then we picked them up off the floor and led them out to the van. Even then I could feel a cold sweat building all over my body and that pre-vomit cottony feeling was starting to come back in my mouth. And just then, the one Chris was leading by made eye contact with me. And when he saw the miserable look I had on my face, he smirked. I'd had it. I gripped a handful of the guy's hair and threw him to the sidewalk. 
As his head bounced off the concrete, I flicked open my knife and brought the tip of it down to his face, hard enough that the bottom of my fist hit his nose and the point of the blade hit the sidewalk. Once wasn't enough though. I wrenched it out of his skull and stared down again and again and again, over and over until there wasn't much of a face left to stab, and most of the tip was broken away from my knife. The only thing that made me feel any better was watching the monster's limbs violently convulse. Mark mentioned one time that vampires heal very fast, and from almost anything, but they can't go into shock as long as they're still alive. So they feel everything that doesn't kill them, as long as the area of the brain that feels pain is intact. That make you feel like smiling, you cocksucker? I leaned down and whispered into his bloody ear. Alright, wrap it up. Throw him into the back with the rest. Let them see that and think over what's about to happen to them. Mark said, giving the trembling body a hard kick to the ribs. So what's Abigail got to do with all this? He asked as we pulled into the Hollywood Antiques parking lot. Yeah, we're under strict orders to bring any of these types to Abigail and she does the rest. Mark says as we begin dragging them out of the van. Once they heard us mention Abigail again, they all lost their shit. It took Han and both the angels to get them into the back of the shop where she was waiting in front of a hidden door in the floor. A staircase led down into some kind of place that I couldn't really see. Just give them a push and let gravity do the rest. She told us, stepping out of the way. I couldn't help but feel a little enjoyment in the look of hopeless terror each of them now had in their faces just before they were kicked down into a basement of Abigail's lair. Thank you, everyone. I'll take over from here. She called back to us as she descended into the dark space and closed the door behind her. We didn't even get to the exit before screams of agony began to well up beneath her feet. Boy, do I feel sorry for you. Mark said, slapping me on the back. So drinks are on me tonight. He added, pulling up some cash from the hotel out of his pocket. A couple hours later and many drinks in, Mark was leaning back on his chair against the wall. His fingers poking out through the bullet hole in his sweater. Hey, look, looks like my dick's out. He sat with a slight drunken chuckle, but the empty, miserable look never left his eyes or anyone else's as we all laughed quietly along with him. We all just took another drink before falling back into the uncomfortable silence. I heard a soft rapping on my apartment door whilst I was lying in bed. Ignoring it, I just rolled over to face the wall. I was still so shook from the house that we busted that I hadn't left my apartment in several days. I'd just been moping around, occasionally marveling at how much of a conscience I apparently had after all this time. Okay, screw this. Louis, I know you're in there, and you know I don't care enough about other people's property not to break this door in. So I'll count to five. I heard Abigail's frustrated voice from out in the hallway. One. Two. Suddenly the goblin came scuttling out of the bathroom where it had either been drinking out of or pissing in the toilet. It was always 50-50 with him. Then he continues to scuttle over to the door where he proceeded to jump and scramble for the doorknob as the count went on. Four. Five. Just in time he got a hold of the knob and gave it a yank as he dropped back down to the floor. It opened up slowly to reveal Abigail with one booted leg hiked up almost to make kick. Oh. Good. She sighed, putting her foot back down as her almost comically tall boot thudded against the wood. Once she walked in, I just rolled back over to face the wall again without saying anything, expecting it to scold me for not letting her in. But, oddly enough, she didn't. Instead, I just felt the edge of my bed move as something small sat down on it. I turned my head a little to see what she was up to. It upset you, didn't it? What you saw in there? She asked, watching the goblin close the door, mildly amused by his improvement in behavior. It happened to you, didn't it? I asked. She answered in a quiet nod. How long? About 75 years, I think. How long was that? I snooped, rolling over just a little more. Um, let's see. She said to herself as she counted on her fingers. I was just about to turn 13 
King Charles II had my father hung for plotting against the crown. I think it happened about 343 years ago, I think. How did it all happen? I kept pressing. You realize you're getting into those questions you already said you don't want to hear answered, right? She asked me back, finally glancing over her shoulder at me. In for a penny, I mumbled with a shrug. Well, like I said, my father was hung. My mother had me and two other children to take care of. So one night a stranger came to town and made her an offer. To take me off her hands. She sold me to that man, no questions asked. He dragged me out of that house in the middle of the night, kicking and screaming and crying for my mother for her to help me. And not a single person in that town even looked out their window at me the entire time. She told me as she scratched the goblin's ear that had crawled up onto a lap. Jesus, I'm so... I started to say, but she caught me off. Oh yeah, this is for you. She handed me a small box. I found your busted up pocket knife in my trash. So I replaced it for you. It's the same one, I made sure. She explained as she handed it to me. CRKT Hisatsu. Yeah, that's the right one. Only one I've carried for years. We sat opening the box and shaking it out of my hand. You didn't have to, though. I could have. No, it's fine. When Mark told me what you did to the one that smiled at you, I couldn't help but feel a little better. Is. Is that all he told you? I asked nervously. No. He told me what you said to him in the van. She answered, and when she said that, I felt my stomach lurch. I don't mean. I tried to say, but she stopped me. Look, it's okay. Nobody understands how weird the whole thing is as much as I do. I'm just happy you cared enough to offer. Most wouldn't even do that. She said as she stared down at the goblin in her lap. Where is Harley anyway? I haven't seen her in a while. Eh, I'm not sure. I haven't either. Hey, I never told you a name. How the hell do you know it was Harley? I asked suspiciously. Hmm? What, you didn't know? She is... Or was a vassal, a follower of Athena. She's been wrapped up in the paranormal world for years. She never told you? Are you shitting me? I yelled, jumping off the bed, almost knocking her and the goblin off in the process. You know how hard it was working to hide all this goofy hoodoo shit from her? So she didn't think I was a freak? Hey, I need a favor. Don't change the fucking subject! I shouted down at her. What is it? I have some errands to run downtown, and, as you can imagine, some with my appearance walking around alone draws unwanted attention. So, what am I doing in all this? I asked cautiously. I just need someone to walk around with me and look half respectable. Dad. I can't believe you got me doing this shit. I hissed down her as we walked into an old hardware warehouse type place. Look at this goofy shit I'm dressed in. I look like a fucking fruit. I complained, pulling on a light blue and green polo shirt she forced me to wear. Oh, calm down, you'll live. She said, also dressed way out of character. Her usual look was like she'd literally crawled out of the 1950s or something. With a long black skirt and long sleeve button-up shirt with long black bow ties in her hair and around a collar. Now she looked like. Well, how you'd expect a 13-year-old girl to dress nowadays. Kinda. She was wearing a weird cow print t-shirt and what looked like athletic shorts. It was freaking me out a little. This way, Dad! She suddenly said with a burst of excitement, snatching me along with her. Oh, no. Don't do that. I said with a cringe and a calling me Dad. What are we doing here anyway? I need some materials. I'm doing work on my shop. After a while, we pushed the flat card up to the register with all the shit we accumulated so far. As we walk up to the counter, the lady catches sight of Abigail and says, Well, hey there. Are you helping your dad today? In the most condescending talking to a five-year-old voice you could imagine. About then, the smell of sulfur and ozone hits me as I turn to see Abigail forcing the most awkward smile I'd ever seen. And as the nerve over her eye started twitching, she answered through clenched teeth. Yes, we're having a father-daughter thing. You 
could hear the fury in her voice, so I decided to pay the lady as fast as we could before all hell broke loose in the hardware store. Here's your wallet, I said, passing her a billy fold as we sat down in the van after packing everything in the back. I hate that. I really hate it. She said softly, just staring at the floorboard. What, when people talk to you like a kid? Yeah. I'm older than they'll ever be. And they talk to me like... Never mind. Let's go back to the shop and drop this stuff off. She gave up. Taking a small bottle of what I could tell by the smell was sunblock. And rubbed some on her cheeks. What the hell are you doing with all this shit? I asked as Abigail carried a stack of lumber about twice my weight in through the back. I'm building more shelves for props. She answered piling the wood into a corner. I thought this was just a front. Well, it is. Was. I started the shop back when people weren't as into movie props and things like that. So I started using the knowledge I had of paranormal artifacts to help authenticate to keep the shop going. But now I want to try and do a more legitimate business because I really do love cinema. She explained, adjusting the timber pile with her foot. Ah, huh, whatever floats your boat, I guess. Anyway, is that all? I asked as she dug through an old pile of tools in the corner and pulled out a circular saw. Yeah, I've got everything from here. She dismissed me as she examined the tool. Right as I made it out the door, I heard a loud whir of a saw and Abigail shrieked in pain. I turned around and ran back inside to see her on her knees holding a blood-drenched stump where her hand used to be. What the fuck did you do? I screamed down at her. I didn't know it was plugged in! Quick, call an ambulance! She yelled back at me and curled into a little ball on the bloody floor. Holy shit, okay, just let me, you little bitch. I narrowed my eyes at her as I saw the smile sneak across her face. You're a monster. Well, of course I am. She sat as calm as cheerful as ever, holding her arm up for me to see the new hand form right in front of me. You just cut your own hand off to fuck with me. Worked, didn't it? She said using the new hand to pick the saw back up and put it on a nearby workbench. There's something wrong with that woman, I swear to God. I sat at the lawn table in the shop, Chris and Johnny sitting around it with me. What makes you say that? I mean, yeah, definitely, but what specifically makes you say it? Just a hunch. I sat pulling Abigail's hand out of a paper bag and tossing it onto Johnny's lap. Oh, Jesus, fuck! He yelled. Panicking and falling back out of his chair. Not cool, Louie. He groaned, hosting his hefty ass back up onto the table. You know I don't handle the blood and gore like the rest of you do. Hey, he was leaving hands laying around. Mark asked as he walked into the shop from the morgue side of the building. Anyway, time we do our bad deed for the day. And what would that be exactly? I asked from my place at the table. Human sacrifice. He stated bluntly. There's a huge, gigantic thing nesting under the San Andreas Fault, and every now and then we gotta slaughter and toss a virgin down into a pit. Otherwise it gets fussy and a huge chunk of California, along with our place of business, falls into the Pacific Ocean. Why a virgin, though? What's a colossal monster care? Not a goddamn clue. It ain't my job to question it. I'm just trying to keep the coastline and my place of business above water. He answered. Now, we need a virgin, of the female variety. So the plan is there's this nerd gathering for the Jap cartoons and it should be easy to snatch up a volunteer from there. Uh, okay boss, two things. One, that's next week. Jose was talking about going to it a couple of days ago. And two, to put this plainly, uh, those things, they be fucking. Rabbit rules apply. They have those things right up next to or in hotel rooms and they just crawl all over each other. Assholes to elbows. My cousin got knocked up twice at those things, says Tim, watching the wind leave his sails as he spoke. Fuck. Okay, so where do we get one in a hurry then? How about here? I said pointing to the map with a dot over at the Los Angeles Bible College. Well, I'll be damned. He does it again. Mike said as he patted me on the shoulder. So, what's your plan for figuring out which one's a virgin or not? What? Why have I got to figure that out too? 
Okay, this might actually work. Mark says as another young woman signs the promise to stay a virgin until they're married for, I guess, Jesus or something. You look like a bunch of fruits, though. He added, looking down at the white polo and black dress pants we're all wearing. Gotta look the part, boss, I tells him. Oh, wait, here comes another. Shh. Hello, miss. Do you have a moment to make a promise to guard your purity at all costs until marriage to show your love for our Lord and Savior? I asked the lady with a smile and a fake sincerity that almost made me cringe. Sure, the peppy woman said as she bounced over to the table we had set up just off campus. What do you need me to do? She said happily as she looked over the stack of papers. Oh, it's so easy. You just sign here these papers with the good Lord and Savior as your witness that you'll stay pure in body and soul until you enter into the holy sanctity of marriage. I enthusiastically regurgitated the lines I learned from watching a few Christy videos on YouTube about an hour beforehand. Is that something you can do? Of course! She answered cheerfully as she scribbled a name across the paper. All right, that's perfect. Now we just say a little prayer together, I said, taking her hands in mine and closing my eyes. Dear Lord, I come before you today with our devout follower, Emily, who has just pledged her body and soul to your glory. Please follow her and watch over her and lead her away from temptation in her journey through this life and as your loyal servant. In Jesus' name, we ask these things of you. Amen. Amen, she repeated as we opened our eyes. All right, see you guys. Thank you all for what you're doing. She called back to us as she skipped away. All right, it's getting late. She'll have to do. Mark said to Chris and Johnny. We both nodded and started following her into a small alley she had started walking down. You'd make some serious cash as a televangelist. That's not half bad how you do that. Yeah, my dad was real religious. Didn't stick, though. I answered as I gathered up the papers off the table and tossed everything into the van. Oh, my head. The girl groaned as she came to in the back of the van, her hands and feet zipped together. What? Where am I? Who are you? What are you going to do to me? She started yelling at the top of her lungs. No, 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 wait. You're the promise, guys. Why why are you doing this? You, you don't have to. You can just let me go and I won't tell anyone, I swear. Just let me go, please, 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 please. She started pleading over and over in a soft whisper while she was rocking back and forth. And then the tears started. Hey, hey! I shouted to get her attention. Look, lady, this ain't nothing personal. And it definitely ain't nothing sexual when I ask you this, but when you said you was a virgin, was that the truth? Wh what? She asked with a sniffle. What does that even mean? Lady, just answer the damn question. Yes? I'm sorry, please don't yell, I'm scared. She begged as she huddled into the corner of the van. Oh, this is going to be a long ride. I mumbled to myself as I checked the time. Still almost an hour to go. What? What are you going to do to me? She asked about five minutes later. Lady, especially don't start asking questions. I'm just going to stress you out between now and then. I tells her to try to keep the peace. Please, I need to know what's happening. You really don't, lady. I'm telling you. Just tell her for fuck's sake. Fine! I yelled back. We aim to sacrifice you to a monster that lives under the San Andreas Fault. If we don't, everything west of it falls into the ocean and millions of people die. Happy now? I... I don't understand. Why would anyone do that? Monsters aren't real. You're all crazy! You're all some kind of cult, aren't you? Let me go! She started screaming out again. So, after about ten minutes of what I knew was gonna happen, happening, we all get kinda sick of it. She'd alternate between calling us crazy monster cultists, crying hysterically, and praying in no particular pattern. Yes! I yelled as soon as the van came to a stop. Don't get too excited, we still got about a fifteen minute hike. No! About half the way up, the girl got too tired to resist, which made things a lot easier the rest of the way. And then she started talking again. How are you going to do it? She suddenly asked. Another short pause, Mark answered. 
We take you up to the top where the entrance to the pit is. We cut your throat, we push you in. Nothing fancy. I'm pretty good at it. I get both arteries in one go. Your blood pressure takes a plunge, it stops flowing to your brain, you're unconscious before you have a real chance to feel anything. It'll be over before you know it, when you get to meet the real Jesus guy or whatever. Once you told her all that, I noticed she relaxed just a little. Like she kind of started making peace with the end. It wasn't something I was used to. Normally when I gotta do the deed, it's all in the heat of the moment or something like that. I wasn't sure how to handle this kind of situation. You're gonna be okay, I told her. Mark's a lot of things, but he ain't a liar. It's fine. If it's happening, then it must be God's will. Yeah, sure, I guess so. All right, bring her over here, Mark said when we came to a stop. So I walk over and look down into the chasm that might as well be in a bottomless pit from where I was. Just a void of stone and blackness all the way down. All right, watch your step there, lady. Johnny said, moving her into position. If we can get you just to face the pit, please. He added, holding his shoulders and turning her in the right direction. Okay, here we go. Mark spoke up, pulling an ancient-looking dagger out of a box he carried with him. You ready, lady? He asked as he took his spot next to her. And she gave him a small nod. Okay. I'm one, ten... Nine. Ouch! She yelled when he gave her a small pinch on eight. And before we knew what happened, her eyes were closing and she was falling forward into the pit. I watched from the other side as she went over the edge and fell into the darkness. Psh! I heard the sound of a can being opened as Mark took a beer out of the box he brought the dagger in. What the hell, is this your idea of a fucking picnic or something? No. We just gotta wait until the body gets where it's going to know if we're still good until next time. He said taking a drink from the can before throwing one to me. Takes about ten minutes. About ten minutes later, he stands up off the ground where he'd been sitting next to one of the lamps and walks over to the pit. His arms raised up by his sides, almost like he was praying now. And a few seconds later, he starts speaking to... Nobody. Like he was praying. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I know it's a little later than usual, but it ain't what it used to be. Well, if you weren't so goddamn picky, it wouldn't be now, would it? We work with what we got, so take it or leave it. Alright, that's what I thought. I'll see you next time. And when he was finished, he just walked past us all grumpy-like and made his way back down the mountain. Well, that was an experience. I sighed to Chris and Johnny at the bar later that night. Yeah, good idea with that sign up thing. Johnny said, grabbing a handful of peanuts from the bowl. I would have thought of that myself. Before I could say anything back to him, I noticed the door open down towards the end of the bar as two guys walked in. Wearing all white. Well, shit. Chris murmured when he noticed. I guess they recognized us because they walked right over and sat on the table next to us. Towards the back. Look, we kind of like this place. So if you want to get messy, we can finish your drinks and take it to the alley? Johnny asked with half a beer still in his hand. To that, they both nod before they stand up and walk back out without a word. When the bartender wasn't looking, Chris reached up and wiggled the decorative baseball bat off the wall and stuffed it down in the leg of his pants. What, we left the heaters in the van? And I ain't fine off two angels best. He told us as he adjusted his billfit club. You still better fight dirty as you can, too. Get creative, cause just one of them's about as strong as all three of us put together. He warned as he ordered several more shots, dumped them all into one glass, knocked it all back at once. They were both already waiting for us outside the bar when we got out and led us to an alley, and well... Ah! Chris yelled as he flew past me out of the alley into the street. It was pandemonium. We were getting bounced and thrown all around, up and down like rag dolls. Once he was done rolling, he was back up on his feet and storming back into the alley. Bad at the ready like a knight with his goddamn sword. You bunch of rat bastards! I'm gonna shove this down your shit-eating throat, I swear to God! The one that just tossed him ran up to meet him and took a shot with the bat right in the ribs so clean I heard the air in his lungs say, Fuck it, and leave on vacation. 
so I took the chance to back up Johnny, who by then was dangling off the ground held up by his neck by the other one. So I whips out my pocket knife and... Oh, did you just stab me in the ass? The guy screams as Johnny falls to the ground. In my defense, I was aiming for your leather, but things didn't go quite to plan. I answered, still holding the knife, now covered in his ass blood. Not saying anything, he starts to limp my direction, and on the way he yanks the leg off an old table, someone left in the alley. Well, this don't look good. I sat to myself before he raises the table like to take a swing. But it don't come down. Instead, I feel something warm hit my face and hear the clatter of wood on the pavement. I open my eyes from where I'd been flinching and see the bottom half of the guy's arm missing. Muscles, holy shit, am I glad to see you! I shout when I see him and that ghoulishly huge blade of his. And instead of answering me, he takes the opportunity to lop the guy's head off. The other guy sees this and tries to take off, but Chris notices it and wraps his arms around the guy's legs, causing him to trip and faceplant. Giving up and running, he grabs Chris's stolen bat off the ground and takes a whack at Han. Doesn't work. Han just grabs the guy's wrist like he's taking a toy from a child and doesn't miss a beat, swinging his blade upwards between his legs. I hear the clicking sound of it as it passes through bone before two halves fall apart and hit the asphalt with a little smack. You're one terrifying motherfucker, you know? Chris says, picking himself up. Hey, Louie, go pull the van around so we can get these two in here. We'll keep lookout until you get back. Yeah, yeah, on it. I say he's back to him as I try to wipe the blood off my face. What the fuck happened to you three? Mark barks as we all file into the shop. Fucking Angel's cornered us at a bar and we got into some gangster shit in the alley. Chris tells him once he sits down at the lawn table. Muscle showed up and pulled our asses out of the fire though. Got what's left out in the van. And these. He added, tossing the sandwich bag full of pinky fingers onto the workbench. Oh, I'll go get the oven ready. Mark groaned as he made his way back into the shop as Muscle followed behind, dragging the tart with the bodies were wrapped up in. The sound of someone knocking on the door echoes throughout the shop. So I snatch my pistol up and hold it at torso level before shouting through the door. Who's there? Jesus, we got as bad as Mark now. My nail gun's broken. I need to borrow yours. He hear Abigail's voice from the other side. I'll leave your promise not to screw with me. Mm. Yeah, I guess so. Fine. He says as I pull the door open to let her in. What happened to you? And you? And you? She said looking around and seeing our freshly kicked asses. You all look like death eating a cracker. Hey, I resent that remark. I think. I say as she starts digging around the tools for the nail gun. I think I saw it over there somewhere. I tell her pointing to the other box Mark keeps some of his torture stuff in. Oh yeah, there it is. She said once she finds it and then proceeds to continue snooping around the shop some more. Is there something else you need? I ask. Kinda. What happened to that book you found? Is it still here? She asks, shuffling through some piles of junk. I was just thinking it's probably better to keep in my shop. I'm used to looking after things like that anyway. As she said that, Mark's phone he left on the table started to ring as an unregistered number comes up on the screen. So Johnny hits the answer and puts it on speaker. Hey Mark, it's Abigail. I had to use the shop's landline. Can you check and see if my cell phone's in the van for me? I can't find it anywhere. That second, all I had snapped to the person in the shop with us, and without a second thought, I snatched my pistol off the table and took a shot at her head. The fake Abigail vanished into a cloud of black mist just before I could pull the trigger. But I had time, just for a second before she disappeared, to see her eyes glow a solid red and an evil grin crack across her face. Seconds later, I hear a disembodied voice hiss from all around. You're lucky I'm not allowed to harm you. Yet. Ow, my fucking ears! I hear Chris yell through the ringing in mine. What? Johnny shouts at him. I shut my fucking ears! Oh yeah, mine too! What the fuck is going on over here? Mark bellows as he storms into the shop, where we're all praying that our hearing comes back. Muscles following close. Boss, you ain't gonna believe what just happened. 
black mist. You sure about that? Mark asked once everyone's ears stopped ringing, and Chris stopped trying to strangle me. What you thinking there, boss? I asked, washing the rest of the blood off my face in the sink. Worrying things, but there's no time for that right now. We're going into shapeshifter protocol. Everyone take a handkerchief. He said as he passed out the squares of fabric. We can't be sure anyone is who they say they are, except us until we get this fixed. So when we have to separate and meet back up, you take out the handkerchief and do the handshake underneath it where nobody can see. You never say what it is where nobody can hear. You never do it in the open where anybody can watch you do it. Only we know it, and it stays that way. And he looked around the room before going to each of us, showing us that we're supposed to shake hands under the hanky. Once he was done, we heard a knock on the door from Abigail. The second Mark figured out what was going on, he told her to come straight over. Then Mark walks over to the door and opens it. Sorry about this. He says to her as he suddenly levels the pistol at her head and pulls the trigger. The shot rings out and I can hear the sound of the case and clink on the floor as Abigail's body hits the ground outside the shop. Whoa, jeez, what was that? I freaked out when I saw him shoot it dead in the face. Relax, I just had to be sure. You do the same. Anytime you see her, brain her first and ask questions later. If it's really her, then she'll be fine in a few seconds. He said before a hand wrapped around his ankle. Help. He said dryly before she snatched him feet first out into the alley. A few minutes later, we were all sitting around the table, Mark with an ice pack over his face, that was now busted up like the rest of ours and a phone up to his ear. Abigail was pacing around like a shark circling a shipwreck as she talked to someone on the other end, which was starting to make me anxious. So you're sure? Absolutely sure none of them could shapeshift? Okay. Yeah, that's what I was hoping you wouldn't say. Okay, yeah. Just be on the lookout. He said before he hung up the phone and put his face to his hands. Well, guys, it wasn't someone fucking with us. So it looks like we gotta keep this serious for now. He told us through his hands. So what do we do next, boss? Chris asks. After thinking for a few minutes, Mark answers first. First, we can't hold on to that book no more. Whoever it was was looking for it, and I don't think they got any better plans for it than the last asshole that had it. So, I'm gonna take muscles with me and go get the book and bring it back here. Once it's here, we take it to the hotel. It won't be safer than if they got it. You. He added, pointing at Johnny and Chris. You two are gonna stay here in case any business as usual needs seeing to. And Louie's gonna take Miss Abigail and make a drop that just can't wait. That way we both got someone with us that paranormal types around here ain't gonna cause no trouble for. No, now hold up! I complained, jumping out of my chair. Why I keep getting teamed up with her like she's my fucking sidekick or something? Excuse me, but you'd be the sidekick. I hear Abigail protest from beside me, but I ignored it. Okay, fine. Would you rather take Muscles and Miss Abigail come with me? Eh, okay, never mind. I'll take Abigail. I shuddered. Don't get me wrong, Abigail's a pain in my side and she'll definitely beat my ass until change falls out. But Muscles, I think, will kill me if given half the chance. Alright, good. Then take this box to this address. I'll go in Muscles' truck, so you could take the van. Just try not to do nothing morally reprehensible whilst you're in there. Uh, but boss, ain't the only reason you have that van is to do morally reprehensible things in? Okay, fair enough. So don't do nothing that's gonna make you have to go around the block and tell everyone your name. Uh, sorry. He apologized when he saw Abigail didn't find it amusing as he did. So where in the hell are we going again? I asked as I sat in the driver's seat and put the envelope Mark gave me between the seats. Looks like some apartment buildings across town where the holding goblin fights. She answered, looking at the directions. See, has a room number on it. She added, showing me the paper. Huh. Okay then, let's get this over with. I don't feel like being out in the open like this right now, longer than I needs to. No way! I thought out loud once the building came into view. It was the apartments we stopped at the day before the fights. I already forgot where this place was. Been here before? Abigail asked me as she steps down out of the van. 
Yeah, but I didn't go in or nothing. Mark told me to wait outside whilst he went inside. That's a little strange. She replied as she unfolded a piece of paper to check the room number. That's about the time I started to get a little pissy about the whole situation. Thinking about how Mark had sent me out in uncertain times to handle this drug habit shit for him. What the fuck's in here? I snapped, holding the envelope up to the light. Money. Suck my ass, it's money. I can't believe this shit! I griped as we walked into the front of the building to look for the right room. After a little searching, we found ourselves at the right place. Room 202. So I reaches up and give the door a few solid knocks and wait for whatever cracked out dope hound who opens it. Who's there? Is that you, Mark? I hear a woman's voice ask from the other side. She sounded real antsy on top of that. That doesn't sound like you. Uh... I started looking over at Abigail for help. When she just shrugged, I answered, Ah, uh, no, ma'am. My name's Louie. I work for Mark. He had something he couldn't get away from, apparently, so he sent me. But I didn't get an answer. Um, Abigail's with me? No, Abigail? Miss Abigail's with you? The Miss Abigail? Why is she here? The lady on the other side asked, sounding like she was starting to panic. No, no, no. Pl please don't freak out, lady. I didn't mean to say it that way. I pleaded trying to get her calm down. Did Mark not call ahead and tell you something was coming? The rat bastard. I groaned to myself. Excuse me, miss. I'm not here to hurt anyone. Except Lou if he doesn't stop making things worse. She spoke in the softest, most sincere tone I've ever heard out of her. Mark just wanted to bring you this envelope. It was a long pause before we heard several latches start to turn on the other side of the door before it cracked open, and a lady with green skin and white hair like the one from that funeral that one time poked her head out just a little. Sorry. She apologized, slowly taking the money from my hand. It's just everyone's been talking about the angels coming back, and it's had me worried sick. And with what happened to the Kralamans not long ago, with those hunters... That's when I noticed she had a kid standing right behind her. Same greenish skin, but dark black hair. Oh, hey, lit. I tried to say to him, but he just took off back into the apartment. Ah, uh, well, okay then. I think that's everything, so we'll just be taking off then. I told the lady before tipping my bowler hat, backing away from the hall, and back towards the elevator. Well, that was fucking peculiar. I said as we headed back to the shop. I mean the lady and the kid. The being terrified of you part, I can understand. You hush. But you're right, that was a little odd. Even for Mark. She told me as she looked out the window as the light rain started to fall. I'm telling you, it was the Four Stooges! I heard Crash yell as we walked through the shop door. Bullshit, that's why they're called the Free Stooges! The chick from before, Madison, with the attitude, screams back at him. Yo, Abigail, tell her she's wrong. Chris shouts over at us once he notices we're there. You're both wrong. She answered as a matter of fact. There are eight stooges. Are, are you insane? insane? They both shout out at the same time. First, she starts holding up a finger in the air like a preschool teacher. They weren't originally the three stooges. First it was Larry, Mo, Shemp, Louis Feinberg, Moses Horowitz, Samuel Horowitz, and their manager, Ted Healy. During that time, they were billed as Ted Healy and his Southern Gentlemen. Then, Ted Healy and his three Southern Gentlemen. But then, Shemp quit. Moe's other brother, Curly, Horowitz, took his place, and they became Ted Healy and the Stooges. If you watch back and pay attention to the opening credits of the older Shemp shorts, and the first few Curly shorts, you'll notice they never say, The Three Stooges. Once they parted ways with Ted Healy, they began to bill themselves as The Three Stooges. That was the lineup until Curly had a stroke. So Shemp came back for another six years until he died of a heart attack. And in between that time, Curly had died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Then a man named Joe Besser joined the group for about two years as a new Curly. And then he left and another Curly, Joseph Wardle, also known as Joe Derrida, joined the group in 1958 for a few full length films and stayed on for a while after that. They then tried to revive the act in the 70s, but Larry died of a stroke. They tried to use another actor who worked with them before to replace Larry, Emil Sitka, but it didn't take, and when Moe died, that was the end of the Stooges for good. 
We all just kind of looked on in awe of the biggest stooge knowledge dump I'd ever witnessed in my life. Aha! Ah! That's only seven! You said there was eight! Madison shouted triumphantly. No, there was a short period after Shemp died where they were using a stand-in so that they could complete filming the shorts that were nearly done. That was Joe Palma, also sometimes called Fake Shemp. But at the time, Shemp and Curly were both dead, and he was an acting stooge on set, making him the missing eighth stooge. Eight stooges in total, she said smugly. I have a whole stooges section in my personal collection, she added, crossing her arms proudly. Wow, you really like the stooges, huh? I asked, mildly alarmed. Well, yeah, I saw some of their first acts live. I met all the main ones at some point and got their autographs. Look, I even have the bell Curly beats everyone with in grips, grunts, and groans. She exclaimed, pulling her phone out and showing me a picture of an old rubber prop bell ring. And look here! I have a photo of me dancing with Curly. He was such a good dancer and he was so sweet. And he even called me toots. It was the best day of my life. When she was done gushing, I was about to say something... But as I was looking down at her all excitedly showing everyone else some of her prized possessions, Mark comes walking in all serious like, All right, time to get this thing to the hotel. And then he sees Madison sitting at the table. Hey, got a quick question for you. He says to her. The serious look still on his face as I see his hand slowly slide up into the front pocket of his sweater. You want to explain to me why the hell you're sitting here in my shop? And was also just standing outside when I walked in. You want to explain to me why the hell you're sitting here in my shop? And was also just standing outside when I walked in. Mark questioned Madison, who just stared at him all confused. Right after that, Mark took a second, glanced around the shop real quick, and suddenly shouted, Muscles, kill her now! All of a sudden, there was a racket outside. Then I heard the sound of somebody slamming into the van. We all took off outside to see what happened and found Han on his ass under a huge den in the van, shaking his head trying to get it back together, and the giant sword that was embedded in the brick wall next to the shop's door. What the hell happened out here? Mark asked him, helping him up to his feet. That, whatever it was, might be above my pay grade. Han said, checking the back of his head to see if he was bleeding. It threw me across the alley and vanished into thin air. What about the book? Mark asked nervously. Fell for the decoy. But we should get moving. I don't know how much time that would buy us. He answered, yanking his weapon out of the brick and heading over to his truck. So after that, we grabbed a few phone books and wrapped them all in newspaper along with the real book and passed them out to everyone there. The idea was that we'd take several vehicles and several decoy books to make it harder for whoever was after it to sort out which was which and who had what. Once everything was ready, we started to file out the cars, and then Madison, who volunteered to watch the shop for us, asked Mark, Hey, real quick, how'd you know I was the real one? Saw your bike over there in the corner next to you. The one outside didn't have one. When I walked in, whoever that was said they were waiting for a pickup out there. Didn't take long to figure it out after that. Thanks for looking after the place. He added, putting his hand on his shoulder. You ever need a favor? You just let me know, and we'll take care of it. While we all gathered around in the alley, Mark started telling us what's what. And when he got to me... Okay, you and Miss Abigail are going to take the van, and you two are going to go the long way around. So take Griffin Avenue up a ways, and then head back down on Fig. No, now wait just a second, dammit! Are you going to tell me why you keep sticking me with her? You two got a good track record. You work good together. And you might not know this, but she's one of the most feared people in the local paranormal population. Word has it that a few weeks ago there was this human paranormal baseball game that she threw a fit over or something and it took every single other para there just to hold it down. And there was some serious fuckers there at the time. So, let me put it this way. If there's one person around here that ain't some kind of actual god who you want on your side, it's her. So shut up and get in the damn van. Go up Griffin, come back down on Fig, get to the hotel. And get this shit done. Yeah, yeah, I'm on it, boss. I sighed, climbing up into the van and turning on the ignition. You ready to rock and roll? I ask Abigail. She crawls up into a seat and puts the wrap-up book in her lap. Yep. Nervous? She asked when she caught me checking the back suspiciously. A little bit. 
I answered. Situations got kind of screwy here recently. Can't argue with that. But I think once they realize what's going on, things are going to get really interesting in a few minutes. She said ominously. Once the book's in the hotel, and they know what it is, and that they won't be able to get it, no matter what they do. So I'm betting they're about to get really desperate to keep us from doing that. Oh, yay. What's the bad news? I asked sarcastically. Don't worry. Stick close to me and you'll probably make it out in one piece. She assured me as I switched the wipers on and pulled out of the alley. Once we were on the road, I noticed the driver in the car next to me and the two other people in it were wearing all white. She was right, it didn't take long. Hey, uh, I think we got company, I tells her, nodding in that direction. What? Already? Step on it. We still have a way to go, she demanded. There's probably more close by. As soon as I started to gas it, the van lurched to the side where they just tried to pit me. Then another impact from the other side from a second car. Now I was really starting to panic because I knew that all it would take was for someone to see that shit and make a report to the cops and then we'd have them on our asses too. Calm down, I've got an idea. Abigail says getting up out of her seat and moving into the back. Just try and hold the van still. She calmly told me she opened up a toolbox and pulled out a few heavy tools like wrenches and hammers out of it. Then she shuffles to the rear door and pops them open. Okay, I need to just get ahead of them for a second. She shouted over at me as the sound of the wind and the cars on the road rushed in from the opening. So I do what she says and I floor it, just as one of the cars tries to move over to me. The second it missed and slipped into the lane behind us, she hurls a monkey wrench dead at them. Through the rearview mirror I can see the hole get punched into the hood of the car before the car starts slowing down. Did you just kill a car with a wrench? I yell back at her, trying to focus back on the road. I got a 1700 mile hour fastball. She shouts back at me. This was nothing. 1700 what? Shut up and get the other one in place. She instructed as she readied a small sledgehammer. So I do what she says and hit the gas again and cut over to the other lane. She took a shot. This time the driver was wise to her plan and tried to steer out the way. But that just made her get off target as she hit the space just over the left wheel. So the whole wheel gets obliterated and the car jerks to the left, causing the rest of it to flip end over end several times before coming to a rest in the middle of the road. Sparks flying all over the dimly lit street. I'm starting to see why people like Fast and Furious movies. She yelled at me excitedly as she watched the carnage from the back. Jesus, Cabbage Patch brand artillery. I said quietly to myself. Okay, come on, close the doors and get back up here. About then my phone starts to ring and I checks to see Mark's number coming up. Hey, you still alive? He yells into my ear as soon as I answer. Yeah, yeah, Abigail handled it just like you said. Okay, we had a hiccup, so we'll probably be there at the same time as you now. When you get there, if we ain't already there too, don't wait for us. Just get inside as fast as you can. He told me and then hung up. Mark says to go on without them if they don't get there first. I relay the message to Abigail, but as it turns out, Mark was right. But as it turns out, Mark was right. Once I see the sign in the distance... Mark and Han and Chris and Johnny pull in almost at the same time as I do. But they had company and were coming in hot. Me and Abigail get there clean, but one of the cars following Mark manages to ram them into the concrete partition that makes Chris and Johnny lock up the brakes and stop way too soon to keep from piling into them. Knowing we had the real book, we both jump out and make a break for the front entrance, but we didn't make it in time. Don't move! I hear a voice shout at me from near the rest of the cars when I was just a few yards away from the entrance. I slide to a stop to see one of the angels dragging Johnny out of the car by his hair. In the dark, I could just make out Mark and Han were both struggling to get out of the truck to get to him. But by then, there wasn't anything they could do. Bring the book here! The real book and maybe I don't snatch his head off! I wasn't sure what to do. It didn't feel right to leave Johnny like that, but I knew Mark would lose his shit if I gave them the book when we were so close. And then it gets worse. Even more of those angel people dressed in all white start coming out of the woodwork. In just a few seconds we were surrounded. Hey Abigail, what do we do here? I ask her, still trying to keep my eyes on the one who had Johnny hostage. I don't think there's a right answer to that question. She answered, clutching the buck in her arms as the rest of the angels started easing their way towards us little by little. I can keep us safe, but there's no way I'll get to them in time to help. By then we hesitated too long, 
They were already behind us, between us and the entrance in any other direction we could have possibly went. I had given up and was waiting for whatever happened next. And then I hear another voice, a deeper, booming voice. I'm almost positive. You were all very clearly instructed not to harm them. I couldn't see who it was coming from, but the second I heard it, every person in White's knee hit the ground. I look around and see this old, Middle Eastern looking guy walk around the edge of the building, both hands carelessly behind his back. Is my word worth so little to you that you would so blatantly disobey me? He asked the crowd of kneeling people who wouldn't even look up at him as he spoke. Who the fuck is this now? I try to ask Abigail. But when I turned to look at her, she looked like she was equal parts pissed to no end and scared shitless. Just think about it for a second, she said nervously to me. These guys are angels. Who do you think their boss is? It's hard to describe how I felt that exact moment. A numb panic, a sickly dread is about as close as I can get. Fuck! I hear Abigail curse for the first time she dug around in her pocket. What the shit are you looking for? I ask her, not taking my eyes off the man. I left my phone in the van again. What the fuck is a phone gonna do? I question, still panicking more than a little. You don't understand! She shouts back and then realizes I really didn't. Because once the guy realized she didn't have a phone, he got a lot bolder and closer. As he got closer, I noticed Abigail glance over to the entrance like she was considering something. But I didn't have time to ask her what she was thinking. Ah, we both know they can't see what's happening outside right now. Those fascinating doors of theirs working the way they do. He said with a smirk. Can't call those meddlesome friends of yours to help either, can you? About then, Johnny, Chris, Mark, and Muscles had slowly made their way over to join us in front of the entrance. Mark was wiping blood off his face with his sleeve that was running down from a gash in the side of his head when he spoke. Come on, everyone, let's go, he said, pulling the door open and walking inside, giving the man one hell of a look whilst he did. Then the rest followed him inside, but I lingered for a second because I couldn't help but ask, What's the deal? Why are you just letting us go? Ah, yes, the new grey one. I've heard of you, he answered calmly. While I'm upset at losing the book, my ultimate goal is taking control of the area. It would be a mistake to harm or kill such pillars of the community. I've been doing this for a long time, and you don't win the hearts of the locals by murdering the people holding their community upright. You have to demonstrate yourself to be a better option. They have to come to you on their own. Yes, I won't have the book, but if this place hasn't, then neither will you. And that's good enough. Now go. Your friends and that little whore of an abomination are waiting for you. I move without thinking. I heard him say it, and the second whore passed his lips, I punched him dead in the mouth as hard as I could. And broke my fucking hand. It didn't even rattle him. But that grin he gave me crawled right down my spine, froze my blood in the veins. So I turned and ran through the door to safety, hold my fucked up hand. What happened? Abigail asks as she sees me running, cradling in my wrist. Ah, nothing. He gave me a look, so I cracked him in the face. I think I broke my shit, though. Oh, yeah, it's definitely broken. Looks like it's turning dark already. Abigail says, taking a look at it. Why would you decide to punch him in the face, of all people? Eh, he just got onto my skin, walking around like he owns the place. Prick. I patted my original fib whilst I started feeling my heartbeat in my hand as it started to swell up. Moron. Okay, you come with me, they'll handle the book. She said, and he marked the real book and pushing me down the hallway. Hey, where the hell are you two going now? One of the guys shouts as Abigail nudges me along. To the bathing area. They have a pool here that heals injuries. You should all come too when you're done. You're all banged up pretty bad too. She told them. She led me down this long, twisty hallway that eventually opened up into a locker room kind of area. Here, this way. 
This is the shower and bathing area. There's a hot spring here that speeds up recovery. You just need to stick your hand in there for about an hour and it should at least be good enough to use again. How the hell do you know the way around the circus tent so good? I asked her suspiciously. Hmm? Oh, uh, how do I explain? She asked herself, giving her chin a scratch as she thought. You see, this place, the hotel, provides a lot of services. A more recent one is they take in vampires like me and they help them learn to live an ethical, peaceful life with the condition. She explains. And that's hard to do? Extremely. When we get turned, we have some physical changes, yes. But there's other things that happen in our mind, too. We develop a kind of secondary, almost psychotic personality. Not a whole new identity, but a way we think that act and overrides things like empathy and compassion and squeamishness so we can feed on other humans. She goes on as I follow her to the hot spring. And you were one of those they helped? No. The other way around. That program started with me. I was the first one to ever really get the condition under control and adapt to a nearly normal life. When they heard about it, they came to me and asked me to tell them how I did it. And then they worked on a program that makes it much easier than what I went through. So I lived here for a while and worked out all the details as they developed the program. Huh. Plot thickens, I says to myself. Hey, is that it? Point to a pool of steam and water made of large stones. Mm-hmm. Just dip your hand in there and hold it. Oh, that feels really nice. I sighed as I submerged my throbbing hand in the warm pool. So, you knew that douchebag outside? She just nodded ahead to answer. How long? About 330 years. She says, staring off into the distance. I was getting a weird vibe by the way she said it, so I dropped in and just let my hand soak. After about an hour, we all met back up in the lobby where Mark and the rest were waiting. I look over to see Muscles got a pissy look on his face. When I realized he was probably mad about his truck, it was a really nice one. Must have cost a fortune, and now it was folded up like an accordion outside. I'd be grumpy too. She really used the spring. Abigail tells them as she walks over to meet them. Nah, we gotta get back to the shop. Having that girl be the only one there makes me all kind of nervous. He waved her off. About then I see someone walk around the corner and down another out the corner of my eye. Hey, did you guys see that? It looked like... Never mind. I gave up. Just wanted to finally wind this long, shitty day down, even though by then it was already well into tomorrow. But you know what they say about the best laid plans in mice and men. What the fuck is going on in my shop? Mark bellows as we get out of the battered van and see the door halfway open, and someone rolling on the ground in front of it. No, I mean it! Explanation now! I run up to the scene and this guy, this huge black guy I'd never seen before, stands up and keeps standing up until I see the full magnitude of his hugeness. 7-4, I guarantee it. It's wide as a barn. Then I look inside and find the source of a noise I'd been hearing in the background since I got there. Madison making all kind of racket at the guy who I just noticed has one hand on his chin and the other between his legs. Get her away from me! The man begged from his place on top of the beanstalk. His voice was deep like a drum, but he has this... like old-timey southern western accent. Made me kind of think of a guy from the Green Mile movie. You gonna tell me what you're doing here or we got a problem? Mark asked the guy. Look, now we ain't got a problem, I promise. I was just coming by because I thought you could help me find someone. So I knocked, I knocked, and nobody came to the door. So I tried the knob and it was open. So I walked on inside. And then that lady over there comes flying around the corner, kicks me right in my damn giblets, and socks me dead in the face with some damn brass knuckles. Didn't even give me a chance to say hello, I'm telling you. He tried to explain, still keeping his eyes on Madison. I ain't here to do any harm, I'm just here looking for someone. Don't give me none of that, you just came strolling in. I'm in there on the toilet and I see someone trying to beat down the door. What am I supposed to think when I turn to see Shaq ducking under the door frame? Madison argued back. 
Also, why you guys got a bag of fingers on the table? Seems like a weird thing to collect. She added, changing the subject like it was nothing. You could not beat my ass, how about that? The guy yells down at her, still rubbing his jaw. Okay, everyone, shut the hell up, I got a headache. Now, who are you exactly? Mark asked the man who has to duck to keep his head from hitting the ceiling of the shop. Oh, beg your pardon. My name's Henry. John Henry. He introduces himself, reaching out with a baseball mat sized hand to shake Mark's. And what do you want? Oh, right, right. Have any of y'all seen a fella about ye tall? He says, holding his hand about chest level. Long blonde hair, a well-built gentleman. Might be going by the name Pie. And what's your business with him? Old friend of mine. Need to catch up on some matters, but he's a hard man to pin down. I was hoping you could help. Henry explains to us. Yeah, Mark answered with a sigh. He was in the area not too long ago, but I could say if he's still here or not. It's been a few weeks already, so he might have moved on by now. Mark says to the guy. Okay, whatever. You all do you. I'm going home to get some sleep. I tell everyone in the shop. Feel like I've been up for two days straight. Jesus, have I been up for two days straight? I lost track of time at some point. Yeah, me too. I hear Abigail say. I forgot my sunblock and sunglasses, and it's going to be sunrise soon. We both walked out of the shop about the same time and started walking the same way down the alley. As we start to get near the end, she says something. I heard what really happened. Outside the hotel. You, uh, huh? I tried to play dumb. Thor was still cracked a little. I heard what he said and why you punched him. You look after people close to you, don't you? Eh, I ain't really never had people that close to me, if I'm honest. My parents were pretty absent most of the time, and I was an awkward kid. Got picked on and stuff like that, so I kind of stayed to myself most of the time. Never had girlfriends as a kid. And even when I got grown up, I kept the ones I had to here and there at a distance on account of what I do. He tells her as she walks beside me. Huh. I guess you might understand me a little better than I thought after all. She says to me as we walk out onto the street. Don't read too much into it. At the end of the day, I'm just a goon, not some deep angsty character from a romance novel. Dirty deeds done dirt cheap. That's me. Don't be too hard on yourself. You're not the only one who's done things they aren't proud of. When you live for three and a half centuries, you build up a lot of history. Some bad, some good. Some a little bit of both. One day I'll have to tell you about the time I helped catch a serial killer in the 1980s using a pick flick video rental store as a base of operations. <laughs> what the hell? I laughed, not just because of the absurdity of what she just said, but because she had to be more specific which 80 she was talking about. And then my laughter stopped when something crossed my mind that gave me a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Hey, sorry to bring it up again, but how long did you say you knew that asshole for? Oh, about 330 years, she repeated. Then it hit me. I didn't even have to ask. Her words from before when I asked her when she was taken away, I would hear like a recording in my mind. About 343 years ago. Hey! Hey! I said, why do you ask? She shouted at me, pulling me out of my daze. Huh? Oh, nothing. Just... So you two are on bad terms, it seems. It's weird to see you hesitate, throw hands with someone. He's different. There's a few around here who can take him, but he avoids them. I ran into him not long ago and he punched me in the stomach so hard it broke my spine. Then he almost killed a friend of mine at the same time. She said as she thought back. He got lucky. You really should be more careful, not just with him, but with all of this. What do you mean with all of this? I've been okay so far. Like when you stabbed that vampire the other night. If you cut your hand whilst you were doing that and got some blood mixed with yours? What, turn into a vampire? That don't seem so bad, it could be worse. Yeah, it could. Because most people that happens to don't turn into a vampire. Their whole body just rots apart and painfully liquefies over several hours until they die. 
She sternly corrects me. Oh, well, that's... Huh? Trying to get over the idea that I could have accidentally got liquefied, I dragged myself the rest of the way home. By the time I was able to see the front office of the apartments, I could already feel my eyes start to shut on their own. But that's when I noticed him. This guy, way out of place. His old look just screamed accountant or something. Giving the building just one last look before getting into his car and taking off. Who the shit is this now stooping around my house? I says to myself, walking up to the office and looking inside. Haven't seen Holly here for a while, I added. But she did seem like she had a lot on her plate. Maybe we've just been missing each other. I'm sure she'll come sniffing around my place when rent's due. So I finally make it to my own apartment and finally takes me a decent shower. It felt like forever since Abigail woke me up by almost kicking down my door and didn't even spare time to eat. I just wanted to climb into bed and pass out. But as I'm drying off, I hear a knock at the door. So I slip some shorts on and open it, kicking the goblin who was just trying to peek outside out of the way. It was just a neighbor from across the hall. I'd seen her and her husband a few times, but never said nothing to him. So I was wondering what she could possibly want from me at this hour of the morning. Sorry to bother you, but I heard you get home and I just wanted to ask you something. Have you by any chance seen the landlord lately? My rent's due and I haven't heard from her or seen her in several days now. Her car's gone and I haven't even seen the office lights come on. Not once. I knocked on the door of her apartment until my hands hurt, but there wasn't any answer. It's like she just up and vanished. I hope nothing happened to her. No, I'm sorry, but I haven't, miss. But I'll see if anything turns up. I know some guys around here who's good at finding people. And I'll let you know if I find anything out. That tells you. Which was at least enough to get rid of her so I could say what I was really thinking. Well, shit. Don't you touch that knob! I yell at the goblin as he reaches up towards it when he thought I wasn't looking. Ever since I found out he can open the door on his own, it had me kinda paranoid about what kind of chaos he'd been causing whilst I wasn't there. I got enough to worry about without you terrorizing the neighbors. In fact, you're coming with me today. What, uh, why you got that thing with you? Johnny asks when he sees the goblin follow me into the shop. How do you even get that thing here without anyone seeing it? I wrapped it up in my sweater and carried it most of the way here. By the way, I've been meaning to ask you guys about that. Why we gotta wear these damn things all the time? They get kinda hot. It's late October and this place is like 80 degrees in the day. It's tradition. It's been that way since the 50s. Roll up your sleeves and deal with it. Mark said, coming around the corner. But Han don't have to wear one, I argued. Hey, you wanna go tell him he's gotta do all that kung fu shit in a thick sweater in 80 degree heat? You go right ahead. But just know he's in mourning for his ride right now, so tread softly. He tells me. It's not that important anyway. Right then. So I think it's safe to say that now the book's gone, we don't have to worry about the freaky monster thing. At least for the time being. But the bad news is Tom wasn't able to figure much out before we took it back. He just said it's probably best nobody has it. So pat yourselves on the back for doing something so selfless. He says to everyone sitting at the table as the goblin snips around the shop. So what's on the agenda today, boss? Business as usual, hopefully. Actually, something came up I might need your help with. You know my place? Well, my landlord kind of... vanished. Poof, by all accounts. Holly's gone missing. Yeah, she... Wait, you know her? Yeah, I lent her the money to buy the joint not long ago. No, wait, hold on. You're the really bad people she borrowed money from to buy the place? For her ex? <laughs> what? For her ex? Is that what she told you? <laughs> Mark suddenly bellows in laughter at my question. Louis, she took out a huge loan from us because her credit was so far in the gutter that no respectable place would grant a loan. And she bought the place from a grieving old man whose daughter was just mauled to death. A mauling that she was partially responsible for. While she was manipulating this, ex of hers to steal secrets from the company he works for. He explained viciously as I sank down into my chair. And you know what? Gets even better. You know Muscle's full name? Ji Han Lao? The girl who got killed? Zhi Zhu Li. 
His goddamn sister. You gullible fucking putz. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. You know what the collateral she had to put down for the loan was? If she defaulted on that shit, Muscles gets to deal with her how he wants. But that's not my problem anymore. Somebody came by a few days ago and bought her out of a debt. Cash too. Big damn bag of cash plus interest. I was so happy to take that deal I would've made Chris give him a reach around if he asked. No, 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 uh, it's Johnny's turn and you know it. They all laugh as I sit there trying to process everything. I'm just in a daze while they're all goofing around and getting things set up for the start of the day. And then I started to think about the guy that I saw the night before. Figuring that made more sense with some context. I was still making myself anxious. Hey, don't worry about it. If you need a place to stay, you can use one of the drawers in the morgue. Johnny slept in one for two weeks one time to hide from his ex-wife. It's true. She was horrible, and anywhere I'd go, she'd find me. But she didn't think I'd sink low enough to hide in a room full of dead bodies for 13 days. Well, I showed her. Hey, look on the bright side. Guess this means things ain't gonna work out with you two. Want me to call Abigail for you and give her the good news? He said with a shit-eating grin, holding his phone up with her number ready to hit dial. No, holy shit, no! I yelled, almost jumping over the table at him to get the phone. Don't even play like that. That shit ain't funny. Calm down, I ain't gonna do it. I'm just breaking your balls. He says, waving me off him as I pawed at the hand holding the phone. Look, kid, don't sweat nothing. You're one of the guys. We'll take care of you. If something happens, I'll make sure you get set up somewhere. Don't think I don't appreciate everything you've been doing around here since you started. He went on patting me on the shoulder just before... Oi! It's Jekyll! I'll come in peace, I'll leave the bloody artillery on the table! Comes from the other side. Mark walks over and opens the door and lets the British guy in from before. Before he walks in, I notice him check over his shoulder for something. Looks like even he's on edge. Once he's inside, Mark closes the door behind him and they start talking. So, he's working better this time. Just the dizziness. Yeah, other than that, it's been the best so far. Way better than last time. Right, very good. Excellent news, huh? So, hey, take this and mix it in next time. That ought to help with the dizziness. The guy tells him, handing him another small glass vial or something. About a teaspoon ought to do the trick. Appreciate it, Doc. Mark says as the two walk back over to the door. By the time they were so far away, I couldn't really hear what they were saying, but I noticed Chris and Johnny were back to pretending not to be paying attention to the two. Once they were done, Mark walks back over to us and says, Okay, gotta take care of some things. Chris can handle all the butchering for the orders whilst I'm out. You remember, just tell Louie what you need, and he'll get it for you. Well, hey, before you go, I got a question. How do you carry that snub nose around in your sweater pocket without sagging and printing real bad? I ask him as he starts to turn around. Oh, right. For yous that don't know, printing is when you can see the shape of a concealed weapon from under someone's clothes. I like the idea, so I got one, but it's so damn awkward when it's in my pocket. Yeah, I was wondering about that too. I just never asked. Cause it ain't in my pocket. Look. He said, pulling the hole of the sweater pocket open to show us where he'd cut a piece of the sweater out from behind it and where we could see the revolver in its holster tucked inside his waistband. Holy shit, that's so cool, he says, examining it. Yeah, I got the idea from Cicero on a trip to Mexico. He told us as he fixed his pocket back into place. Works with knives, too. Now I'll be damned. Now I kind of feel dumb, I says to him whilst playing with my own sweater. Hey, Johnny, hand me those scissors over there. Why the hell are you here again? I ask Madison after she shows up about an hour later, even though she didn't have a delivery to pick up. It's a slow day. Things don't pick up until sun starts going down, even on a good day. That don't do much for explaining why you're here. I was bored and this place seemed more like home, you know, than out there. Might be the accents. Who knows? She says, pushing her way through the door, her bike rolling over my shoes. Don't you got those friends back of the apartments or something you can hang out with? Nope, the ones that are there are asleep. They usually work mostly at night. She explains, plopping herself into the chair at the table. So what do you guys do here anyways? Given up, I finish putting the rest of the packaged meat into a mini fridge and says, About the same stuff a regular mafia does, I guess. 
just with the spooky types. Well, it gets a little weirder than that sometimes. We had to do a human sacrifice thing yesterday. And that's still kind of weird with me. Oh, and the other night, there was that... Never mind. I don't think the Mafia chops up people and sells them as food. The Godfather would have been a lot crazier if they did. I'm just saying. She says as she picks up the bag fingers off the table. Also, you might want to do something with these. They look like they're starting to turn. Aw, oh, shit, we still ain't dropped those off yet at the hotel. Chris says he comes around the corner where the desk is. That's a shitload of cash just sitting there collecting dust. Hold up, I'll call Mark and see if he wants you to run them up there. So I propped myself up against the workbench once I finished wiping the blood off and waited. After a few seconds, Chris gets his look on his face. Oh, he didn't pick up. Must still be busy. He says after he puts his phone away. Okay, judgment call. Go ahead and take my car and run these up there. Bring the cash back. Just keep your eyes open. Once you're outside a hotel, you're on your own with a lot of liquid money. Why'd you? He says as it gets up and take the keys from him. Oh, I'm coming too! I hear Madison chirp from behind me, jumping out of her seat. I've been wanting to see that place for a while now. Chris, tell her no. Hey, what's it gonna hurt? Chris waves me off as he flips through some papers. Hey, Johnny, where's those receipts for the cleaning products in plastic containers? I put them in the filing cabinet under not illegal but still suspicious. You really don't got nothing better to do? I ask as she climbs into Chris's car and took the bag of fingers into the glove box. Better, not really. The other people I hang with are kind of wussies. Don't do that. Be nice. What's the sense of decency? Hey, that's a felony. A girl can only take so much. Fair enough, I says as we pull out of the alley. Jeez, I feel like I've been here every day this week. I complain as we step out of the car and I kick a little piece of Hans' truck out of the way. Got the fingers? Yeah, right here. She tells me as she waves the bag around and wiggling her fingers through a set of knuckle dusters in her other hand. Where'd those come from? Borrowed them. I don't think you really need those until we at least come back with the money. You never know. Jesus Christ, more fingers? The short guy behind the desk shouts at us whilst we walk in and he sees the bloody sandwich bag. Two sets this time, chumps. I declare as Madison drops them on the desk. Show me the money. Cash too, I don't want Mark crawling up my ass for showing up with gold bricks. Yeah, yeah, here's your damn money. The guy says he slides the stacks across the counter. Holy shit! That's like four stacks of hundreds! Whose fingers are those anyways? Madison freaks. Some angels we got into a fight with in an alley yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Everything's kind of running together right now. I tells her as I stuff the money into a front pocket of my sweater. Which then immediately falls to the floor because it just cut the back of the pocket out. Son of a bitch. So, after I pick up the cash and tuck it under my hat, we walk out. But instead of walking outside, I ran into some kind of invisible wall. <laughs> got him! The tall guy behind the desk bellowed as I rubbed my nose. I have to hit this switch over here before you leave, stupid. He says as he hits something under the desk and the door makes a clicking noise. Otherwise, there's nothing to walk out into. You okay? You smash your face pretty hard. Madison asks as I start my way to the car. Yeah, yeah, fucking punks. I grumble, checking my reflection to see if my nose was bleeding. Let's get out of here before I go back in there and... I started to say, but my phone starts to ring. And I look to see it's Chris's number. Hey, what you need- Back to the shop now! He screams into my ear and hangs up. Something ain't right, I says to Madison and put the car into gear and speed off to the shop. What's going on? I shout to Chris as I barrel through the door. But he don't answer. Instead, I see him and Johnny and Han standing around looking at something. And I see Mark. His unblinking eyes staring up at the ceiling from the workbench where his body had been laid. No. No, no, hold on. This ain't right. What's going on here? Why is he like that? This shit ain't funny, guys. Nobody's laughing, Louie. Han found him like this on the way here. Says it looks like it was beaten to death. Chris says without looking up for Mark. Hey, what's going on? 
Manishin repeated my words as she finally came in behind me. Is that Mark? I need to sit down. Says as I pull a chair away from the table and sink down into it. It looks like it was someone very strong. Every size hands. These two cuts are made by knuckles on the same hand at the same time. I hear Hans say to Chris as he points something out to him. Both of his legs and one of his arms were broken as well. You can see here on his sweater and his pants he used a good arm to try and drag himself along the pavement. These wounds on the side of his head, they were made by the butt of his pistol. He added, holding up Mark's revolver. Found next to the body. No rounds expended. As he talked, I heard the chair slide up next to me and Madison sit down in it. She didn't say anything though. I guess she didn't feel like leaving at the time. I just sat there in silence. I couldn't put my finger on it, but something didn't seem right as I tried to think of who did it. You think it's safe to say it was the angels? Johnny asked Han. That don't make sense though. Louis said they weren't supposed to hurt any of us. Even that shape-shifting thing, whatever it was, said the same thing. They didn't seem to be listening before that, Johnny argues. Seems like the likey thing. But I mean, still, it's not like the list of people who wanted Mark dead was a short one. I could throw 50 cents worth of nickels out the door and hit 10 people who would likely have done it. What happened? Fucking fuck! I shout as Abigail kicks the door to the shop open and barges inside. Hours later, we're still all in the shop. Once Han had decided he had learned everything he could from the body, Chris pulled Mark's torn up sweater off him and looks through his pockets to remove anything left. He finds a small vial that Dr. Jekyll brought over earlier. The fluid still inside. Once he finished, he set everything to the side. Then we put him on one of the carts and wheeled him off into the morgue. Chris and Han lifted him up onto the sliding table to the furnace as me, Madison, and Johnny and Abigail gathered around. You knew him the longest. Chris says to Abigail. You want to say something? Well, I guess. But I still didn't know him very well. He was a really private person. But to his credit, for all his faults, he was willing to do what had to be done for the paranormal community. No matter how dirty his hands got along the way, he'd always say that someone had to do it or it wouldn't get done. And he hated hunters more than I'd ever seen anyone hate anything. Mm-hmm. We all mumbled in agreement. He'd always treat me with respect. He was the first one to start calling me Miss Abigail to make me feel like an adult. And then everyone else started doing it because they heard him do it. He may have been stern and rough, but he was also fair. And I have no doubt that his absence will be felt even by people who didn't even meet him. It's been good knowing you, boss. Chris added before sliding him into the furnace. Hey, where are you going? I asked Han as he heads straight for the door. We need to figure out what happened to Mark. Yes? I know a guy who might be able to help. He's good at figuring these kinds of things out. He answered before leaving without another word. What do we do now, boss? Johnny says, handing Chris Mark's red sweater. She's right. Once word gets out, shit's going straight to hell. And Mark's not just gone either. We're a man short. Well, I might have a solution for that last one. Madison suddenly speaks up. Hell no, absolutely not. Have you both lost your motherfucking minds? Chris roars as he stampedes through the shop. I'm just saying she's got a point. We're one down and things are apparently about to get real hairy around here. We don't got time to hold open auditions. I try to talk Chris down. The whole time since Dirty Work Inc. started has never had a broad in the lineup. And even so, who's she? She's just one of those riders rolling around on a bicycle all day. Think about it. Remember that Mark would say about a cat that don't want to be held? Yeah, she's a girl, but Mark trusted her with a drop. And let her watch the shop. And she chose violence the second she saw someone she thought was breaking into the shop. A huge guy twice her size. And she dropped him no questions asked. We ain't gonna get better than her on short notice. Look, Louie, 
I got a lot more important shit to deal with right now. I'm just saying, give her a shot. What's it gonna hurt? Hell, you can kill two birds with one stone. Get your diversity box checked by being... What's the word they use? Inclusive? I says to him. Inclusive? What's that even mean? She's dating some girl that lives in my apartment building. That's good for the public image. All the big companies are doing it. He puts some minorities in the front and center and they say, Hey, look how great we are. And that makes people like you more. I try to explain as best I can. Do I look like I care about being inclusive? That's the neat part. You don't. But that don't matter because you don't have to. It's all about what everybody else thinks. I go on, hoping he doesn't suddenly realize that we aren't a public-oriented company anyways. So you're gonna make me use the trump card, huh? Okay, think about this. All that riding around on the bike all day? She's got a really nice ass, and she'll be walking around here all the time. Jesus Christ, if I say yes, will you shut the hell up and go somewhere else? He said yes. I says to Madison, who was waiting in the alley with Han. These are yours. I add, tossing in Chris's blue sweater and new black derby hat. Kind of pissed you got yours right from the start, though. You don't maybe have a pink one to match my hair? She asks, unfolding the loose hoodie. Don't push it, I tell her. That's gonna be the least of your worries here real soon. Speaking of worries, has anyone else seen my goblin? He hasn't broken anything for a while and I'm starting to think he's planning something. No sooner that I said that, the damn thing comes staggering out of the shop. Shut all over his face and smoke coming off of him. Hopefully I'll never have to find out what you just did. I sigh down on him. Okay, come here. Pay attention. See that shit here on the bottom of their foot? I ask it the next after pulling open one of the drawers with the body in it. If there's something there, that means they've either been donated to science, they're gonna be cremated and won't nobody know the difference, or they don't have nobody who gave a fuck about them when they died. That means we can do with them as we so choose. You following me? I think so. Alright, good. So, a line means it's fresh. A day or two at most. A check means they died somewhere fancy like a hospital and they got refrigerated pretty quick. We like these the best. A circle means they ain't so fresh, and they weren't cooled down so quick. They're usually the ones that got found a few days later or something. Usually when somebody started to notice a smell. We got a few customers who like these, but for the most part, we don't use these ones too often. You still with me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Outstanding. So, what you're gonna do is we need two of the ones with checks tonight. You're gonna find two of those, Put them on a cart over there, wheel them back to the shop, and then I'll tell you what you do after that. I tells her as I leave her in the morgue to figure the rest out. Hey, we got some problems. Danny says he's got someone causing trouble down in the goblin fights. Chris tells me once I'm back in the shop. Guess who gets to go deal with that? Hey, where's Mark? Danny asks once he sees me walk through the door to the warehouse. None of your business. Today you're my problem. So what's the issue? Well, promise you won't be mad. He didn't give me a choice. Says a man in white steps out from behind the column and into the light. It would seem that we have some current events to discuss. And the deep voice of the man from outside the hotel says, Come, sit with me. Won't you? Danny, you backstabbing fuck you! I yells at the cowering goat guy. You better hope I don't survive this, cause if I do, you damn sure won't. Now there's no need for the fucks. The guy says, pulling a chair behind him as he walks over to me. Now sit. He adds with a sternness in his voice now. Well, frankly, it did the trick. Cause my ass was in that chair before I could tell my knees to bend. So you're, uh, the god, I guess, huh? As it just so happens, that's not the most important issue at the moment. I'm sorry to say. As I said, current issues withstanding. 
Oh, is this about that Christian girl we sacrificed? Son of a bitch, I knew we shouldn't have let her keep praying the whole way there. I interrupted him. The guy that can sleep Abigail with one shot, who I was currently trapped in the warehouse with. Pardon? But who? Praying? Oh, no, no. Do you really think I can hear all of that? If they aren't within earshot, then whoosh, right out into the void. But just between us, there wouldn't be much I could do then if I could. Suppose we stay on topic? He explained, finally taking a seat across from me. And what's the topic? And more importantly, why'd you call me here to talk about said topic? Ah. He started, raising the finger. First of all, I didn't specifically plan for you to show up. Any one of you would have equally done well. You being here is, simply put, the luck of the draw. That aside, leave that thing alone. He demanded when he saw me try to get to my phone. I've made the mistake on more than one occasion of forgetting to consider those little things. But seeing as I was considerate enough to come alone, a show of good... <laughs> faith. I expect you to show me the same consideration. Fine, I tells him, pushing it back down into my pocket. So what do you want? I asked, narrowing my eyes at him. Mark, he explains plainly. I cannot say with absolute certainty that his death was not caused by one of my people. However, I can assure you and your associates that I did not give that order. Wait, Mark's dead? You, you shut, shut up. up! We both shot at Danny at the same time. Why tell us that? What do you get out of us not thinking you did it? I asked him suspiciously. I've already explained this to you. Hearts and minds won fairly are much more reliable than ones taken by force. Everyone from governments to cartels knows that. It's no different in this particular case. I can't have the entirety of the local paranormal world thinking I had killed Mark. Los Angeles is one of the areas most densely populated by the paranormal. If an idea solidifies here, then it won't be long before it migrates to the adjoining areas and beyond. Simply put, this is a domino I can't have falling in the wrong direction. Understand? I... Guess that kind of checks out. But what's this fixation on the paranormal types? Why not just, you know, focus on all the godly Jesus-y regular ones all over the place? That's my own business. My point is that I personally had no part in this, and I need you to communicate that to your comrades for me. Is that understood? Crash! Guys, holy shit, you're not gonna believe what just happened! I shouted, kicking open the door to the shop. Why would he lie? I asked Chris as I sit down at the table. Hey, also, where's Madison? I said I'd make a few drops right before you got back. Oh, have you seen my brass knuckles there anywhere? Um, no. I lied, knowing exactly where they had been stolen to. Anyway, where's everyone else? I got them all over the place. We got a lot of groundwork to lay before the word spreads that. Uh, there's been some changes around here. We got a lot of friends to make, a lot of pockets to line, and a lot of alliances to forge. And even less time if Danny knows now. The gossipy fuck. That all sounds like a whole hell of a lot of work to me, boss. Yeah, and we're all gonna be sharing the load. He tells me. The whole paranormal community, especially the underworld, is about to be in an opera as soon as the word gets out. And those angels ain't gonna be doing us no favors neither. I'm serious, Louie. Buckle up. Oh my god, I'm so tired. Madison groans as she stumbles in through the shop door about a week later and just lays down on the floor in front of me. Yo, hey, I probably wouldn't do that if I was you. I never once seen that floor clean since I've been here. I says down to her. Bad day, huh? Oh, don't get me started. She waves in front of me. So I head towards the back to see if there's anything else I ought to do before I head out. Hey, did you hear that? Sounded like something just exploded. I hear her ask as I walk away, but I didn't hear nothing, so I just kept going. 
Hey boss, you need- Yo, hey, you all right there, boss? I stop and ask when I see him just sitting there with his head in his hands. It wasn't normal not catching him up to something. Oh, uh, what? Yeah, I'm fine. What the hell is it? Oh, nothing. I was just seeing if you had anything else for me to do before I collapsed into a limp, unconscious pile on the ground. Nah, just leave whenever you want, and tell Madison she's done for the night, too. He says, looking back down at his desk and trying to look busy with something. Hey, Chris says we could take off. I tell her once I walk back in and see her still spread out on the floor. No, really, you're gonna catch something new to mankind down there. And about the time we're both ready to head out... A few softer than usual knocks tap out from the other side of the shop door. Looking nervously at each other, I slide my pistol out as she wiggles her fingers through the set of brass knuckles and we slowly open the door to see a hooded figure standing just out of reach of the overhead light. Hey, I know you! I says once I notice a weird green-skinned lady underneath the hood. From the apartments, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry to come like this unannounced, but Mark said that if I ever didn't hear from him for any more than a week, that I should come straight here and nowhere else. She says, taking a small step closer. Oh, okay then. And who are you exactly? Hey, at least invite her in, you inconsiderate jerk-off. Madison interrupts, pushing me out of the way so she can walk in. Come on over here and sit down, she tells the lady, waving over at the lawn table in the middle of the room. As she finally walks in, I notice she's not alone. The kid from before is with her, too. Hey, Chris, uh, maybe get in here, I call towards the back room. Oh, who's this little guy? Madison asks when she sees the kid. Chris, we could use you over here, I shout again. Oh, uh, yes. I guess I need to explain. You see, this is Mark's son, Alex. Chris, get your ass in here! Oh my god, what the hell do you... Who the hell is this now? He asked me a complaint. Well, about that, I start. It would appear that this is... Mark's kid. I say, pointing to the kid hiding behind the green-skinned woman's leg. His... Eh? Yes, his son. Now can someone please tell me where he is? It's not like him to just disappear like this. The woman asks, and... And I look over at Chris, and his eyes start to twitch as his face is all weird, like it's about to sneeze or something. I... I don't got time for this shit. I gotta go to work. He says before turning and taking off back towards his desk and out of sight. Now Madison's looking over at me like I know what the hell I'm supposed to do. And then I realize. I'm about to have to tell this kid his dad's dead, aren't I? And that... That right there got to me. All the years I've been dealing with mob justice, this part is the part I never saw. Like... How many people had to look down at some kid, some poor asshole's son or daughter, and tell them they ain't never going to see them again? That, hey, that they shouldn't have fucked around with the wrong people, but they didn't. Some piece of shit shot them dead in an alley somewhere over 1,500 lousy bucks. How many kids had to hear that because of me? Because I wasn't any good at nothing else. She must have noticed my eyes starting to water because as I was thinking that, she seemed to have got the right idea and started tearing up. Worst part, the kid hadn't gotten wise to it yet. I had to watch as she explained it to him. Even Madison, the psycho bitch that she is, was starting to cry. After everyone had a chance to calm down a little, me and Madison were finally able to explain what happened to Mike and that we didn't know anything about the kid. So, I guess that makes you, I guess his wife, right? I finally ask. Oh, no. But I get it seems that way. She answered with a sniffle. No, I'm his sister-in-law. I'm Alex's aunt. She goes on to explain as she holds the still sobbing boy in her arms. You see, not long after he was born, my sister died. Or I should say, she was killed. 
But Mark knew he wasn't fit to raise a child on his own, so I told him I would look after Alex. And ever since then, Mark made sure we had everything we needed, and more. And he would still come by at least twice a week to see him and give him his... Before she could finish, there was another knocking at the door. Oh Jesus, who the hell is it this time? Madison's long last twin? I complained as I snatched the door open in frustration. No, oh, just me, I'm afraid. That jackal guy says to me once it's open. Oh. Well, hell. I'd hope I'll make it here first. He adds when he sees the woman and child sitting at the table. Say what now? I ask as he slides past me and into the shop. I came here as soon as I heard. I would have called, but I only had Mark's number, you see. He tells me as he makes himself at home. Someone want to tell me what the hell's going on now? I ask, getting a little frustrated at that point. Oh yeah, right, right. Did you find among Mark's possibles a small vial, likely containing a liquid inside? Yeah, it's over in that drawer over there. He says, pointing to the cabinet where we'd left Mark's things that he had on him. Well, you see, this little lad in here with us, as you might have noticed by now, is part Mark, who I've been led to believe is a pretty standard example of her own category of homo sapien. Well, this lovely woman, he adds, gesturing at the lady, is an elf. A wood elf, to be more specific. And little Alex here is a bit of both, which ain't as simple as it sounds. See, sometimes when the normal and paranormal get together and have children... There could be problems unique to that situation. Conditions you can only get when one part of your body or DNA isn't compatible with another part of it. Like our little Alex here. He says giving the kid a pat on the head. So Mark came to me when he noticed his son seemed to get sick all the time and getting worse. Didn't take me long to figure out that issue. But treating it, well that took more time. And only just here recently, I finally got something that seemed to do the trick. He went on as he dug through Mark's stuff. The only side effect, it makes you a little wibbly wobbly. And that's what this is for. He says, holding up the vial. Bet your poor little head's just been swimming the past few days, hasn't it? Here, take a little sip of this. Just a little one. He tells the kid as he hands him the liquid. I'll be damned. I really thought it was drugs, I said to myself as I listened. Oh, hey, you said his wife was killed. What happened? I asked the lady. Oh, well, I don't know all the details, just what he told me. But, let's see. There was this group of people, and they all had become fascinated with this show about hunting monsters. But for the most part, it was just some wild fantasy to them. They didn't know the paranormal world was real. Until one of them got a job at this new company that allows humans to drive as paranormals around for money. But instead of just working for the company, they went and told their friends about us. That monsters were real, and they need to kill as many of us as possible to protect humanity. According to them... So they started using this company's system to find us. Then they'd save the location, come back later, and kill us. My sister was one of the first they got to. Then Mark found out. They were all nothing but ash by the end of the night, from what he told me. I couldn't even speak. I was just staring wide-eyed as everything started to make so much more sense. But it still keeps happening. It used to be that we were more separated from the regular world, but now these... What do they call themselves? Hunters. They keep finding out we exist because of these new businesses that are bringing in humans to work with us. She goes on with genuine worry in her voice. It's especially bad when you consider the area. And now that Mark's gone... What do you mean by that? Madison speaks up to ask. What's so special about here? It's one of the most heavily populated centers of the paranormal population in the world. Specifically because of dirty working, and the work it does. Because of all the work that goes into keeping the bad and violent elements separate from the rest of the community, we felt safer here than anywhere else in the world. 
where the stronger and more aggressive ones would exploit those just like me? Wood elves like us? We aren't very strong. We're just different. And there's others like us. This is a place where we can rest easy for the most part. But that also means we're easy to find if you know where to look. So, what you're telling me is that we're actually responsible for holding up one of the biggest concentrations of paranormals in the world? I ask in the resounding disbelief. Just the five of us. Mm-hmm. We come from all over the world to live here. It's actually become hard to find anything other than vampires anywhere else. Most of us are on the west coast now. And most of that is here in Los Angeles County and the outlying area. But I feel like that might start to change now that... Me and Madison were both real quiet as we walked home together that night. Something we made a habit of over the past week since we both lived in the same buildings and we both been waiting for the rain to die down before we left. She looked like she had something on her mind, as I did at the time. Hey, you good? I finally asked her. I guess so. That whole thing really shook me up though. I already know exactly what show she's talking about. I watch it all the time. I even used to think about how cool it would be to travel around killing monsters like in the show. Now I just hate myself for it. And what's worse, I make deliveries for one of those companies that's causing all the... <sighs> yeah, I never really thought about how they figured out all that was real. But I guess if you got companies literally hiring people just to tell them about all that shit. It seems likely to happen eventually, I guess. What about you? You had a real unusual look on you tonight. Yeah, I guess I'm just not feeling too great about myself right now either. The answer is I feel the rain pick up. Well, I guess I'm gonna head up. I had once I reached the stairs leading to my apartment. See you at work tomorrow. Yeah, same. She says before turning and head to her place. Oh, oh, wait, hold on. I stop it before she leaves. Yeah, take these and give Chris his back. He's graying my hair over asking about the fucking things. I says, tossing her a new set of knuckle dusters. Oh, wow, thank you. She says, tucking them in her pocket before starting to walk away. Hey, who's that over there in front of my door? In the yellow raincoat? She asks, pointing over to the figure laying on their stomach in front of the apartment. Fuck if I know, you expecting company? I ask as we both start to ease our way closer. Nah, ain't nobody in there either. They're all working right now. She tells me as we walk up to the person, my hand wrapped around my revolver I was aiming at them through my sweater. It wasn't moving, so I reached out and gave it a kick in the side. Uh, I hear a small groan. Hey, that sounded like... I trailed off, using my foot to kick the body over onto its back. Abigail? What in the grandest fuck are you doing? I shout down at her. And why the hell are you black? I add when I see her mostly covered in some kind of black dust. So tired. Need shower. Sleep. For the love of Christ. You go ahead, I got this. I tell Madison as I reach down to grab Abigail by the waist and start dragging her across the lot and up the stairs to my apartment. Oh, yeah, sure thing. After all, that's not incredibly suspicious looking to nothing. Towels, soap, clothes. I say as I lay everything out in the bathroom sink for her. And hurry up, I still want to get washed off too. Then maybe we should... Ju Never mind, I'm too tired to mess with you tonight. Leave, she says, give me a hard shove out the bathroom before pushing the door closed behind me. Jeez, I guess even she's having a hard time right now, too. Wonder what she's been up to, I says to myself as I lean back into the new recliner I just bought. Hey, you know who I haven't seen since I got back? Aha! I yell at the goblin as I catch him climbing in through the window, chewing what seemed to be a steak he had pilfered from someone's kitchen. I got nothing. I'll deal with you later, I tells him as he notices the sound of running water, and immediately runs over and starts looking through the crack in the door to see who's in the bathroom. 
About the time he gets his nose under the door and gets a whiff of her, he goes off. Calm down, she'll be out in a minute. Can't believe you like her more than me. I feed your ass. I sneer at the damn thing as it claws at the door. Hey. Hey, wake up. Wake up. Oh, thank God. It was all just a bad dream. I groaned as I wiped my eyes. Ah, fuck. I sigh when I see Abigail standing over me, her wet hair dangling over my head and trickling my nose. I smell coffee. Yeah, the shower woke me up a little, so I made some. It's awful because you buy crap instant coffee, but it's better than nothing. She says down to me where I was laying back in the recliner. Personal space, please. I mumble as I push it to one side so I can get up and get to the coffee. So, you want to tell me why I found you passed out down there in the rain cold and blackface? Right. Well, the black stuff was soot from a car bomb. It wasn't my car, she added when she saw the look on my face. Most of my clothes got blown or burned off, so I had to wear the raincoat. What the hell are you being up to? Various forms of deviltry, she says dismissively. The angels have been getting aggressive, and I've been doing everything I can to antagonize them all week. That reminds me, I have a lot of bodies I need you guys to burn. They're starting to pile up and stink. I'll see what I can do. I sighed as I finished the cup of coffee. Alright, I'm gonna take a shower. Try not to blow anything up. Either of you? I say to both of them as I close the door to the bathroom. Oh boy, that felt grand. She stole my bed. I say under my breath as I walk out of the bathroom to see Abigail had already passed out in my bed with the goblin curled up at her feet. Ah, well, shit. Yes, I got only one option. I sigh, looking over at the empty recliner. Ah! Abigail grunts as she sails through the air and plops down onto the chair's cushions. Steal my bed? Fuck you think you are. I mumble as I pull the blanket up and get comfortable. Hey, what the hell? She shrieks. Can I at least have a blue? She huffs as a balled up comforter smacks her in the face. I hear the knocking on the door the next morning as it wakes me up, but I don't do nothing on account I don't really care who it is. Until I hear the doorknob turn and Abigail say, What do you want? And I turn over to see her standing in front of the halfway open door in my t-shirt I let her use after she took a shower. With her still messed up bed hair looking at some guy in a business suit. Oh Jesus Christ, this is just what I need right now. I groan, jumping up out of bed, shoving her out of the way, pushing the guy back out into the hall. Who are you? Who are you? What do you want? Who are you? I ask, getting up in the guy's face. Relax, sir. I'm not here to judge. The man says as he adjusts his glasses. Even if it seems warranted, I'm here to make you an offer. He said, producing a piece of paper out of a black leather folder. My employer has recently acquired this property. I would like to offer you a not insignificant amount of money to vacate the dwelling, post haste. Huh. You saying I'm getting paid to be evicted or something? I ask as I look over the paper. Well, no, not exactly. We're more reconstituting the residency here. Very official and technical, you see. Difficult to explain. Very difficult. But... Oh. Oh my. He suddenly says with a glance over my shoulder. I turn to see what he's looking at, and it's Abigail and the damn goblin both peeking out through the crack of the door. Whoa, hold on, I, I can't explain that. It's a monkey. A uh, horribly disfigured monkey. Yeah. You buying that? Oh, no. No, I'm terribly sorry, sir. The guy apologizes, taking back the paper and tucking it away in the folder. This is just a misunderstanding. You see, this property is being reallocated as a residence for both the paranormal and those who work in paranormal contact heavy vocations, which it would seem is the case with you. If you check, this location has already been removed from the standard mapping application. I'll be damned, he's right. It ain't there no more. I say once he leaves and I look at the map app on my phone. Yeah, that's not unusual for paranormal housing. 
Abigail tells me she puts on some sunblock she made me borrow from the neighbors. Wonder what made them buy this place up, though. There's already one like it in Lincoln Heights. Why would they need another? Who knows? But as long as my rent stays the same, I don't care. I don't want to give up a place that's walking distance from work. And all those good Mexican restaurants along with in North Broadway. Oh, hey. Check that out. I'm starting to learn the way around this place after all. I say all proud-like. I still get turned around sometimes, and I've been here since... 1992, I think? She told me, sounding a little frustrated. Okay, let's go. She added, heading out the door with a fresh coat in the sunblock and a pair of sunglasses on. Whoa, hey, what's going on here? Madison blurts out as she sees us walking down the steps together. Abigail still my t-shirt and my crocs she also borrowed flopping ridiculously as she tried to walk in them. Mind your damn business, I sigh, not in the mood to argue. So that fancy guy come knocking on your door this morning too? I asked Madison once Abigail broke off and headed back in the direction of her shop. Yeah, he did, until he realized he didn't actually pay the bills at the place. Then he just said he'd come back later or something. I don't know, I wasn't really paying attention all that much. Yo, where's Johnny? I ask as we walk through the door to the shop. He usually beats me here in the mornings. I gave him the day off. He ain't handling Mark too well and I've been pushing him kinda hard. He got here earlier and couldn't hold it together so I told him to go home. Chris says looking through some papers. Here, you two are gonna have to share his load for the day. Maybe between you and the diversity hire, you might be able to handle it. Yeah, it's handing us both our own paper. Whoa, holy shit, boss. He does all this? In a day? Yeah, Johnny's real workhorse. Best of luck. He says before waving his both off. Try not to fuck nothing up. Yo, this is ridiculous. No wonder Johnny filed him the way he did. There's so many plastic containers. He shot the Madison on the other end of the phone. No, really, you gotta come around to the back and see this shit. I tells her as the workers at the van warehouse literally shovel the containers for the meat into the back of the van. Whoa, that is a lot, she says when she meets me around back. Where did he keep all these? There's a storeroom in the hall between the shop and the morgue. I guess that's where they go. Yep, I'm in here. And tell Madison once I open the door to the storeroom. After about two hours of moving containers from the van to the storeroom, we finally finish and parted ways to work on our own things to pick up Johnny Slack. I had to go way ass out in the middle of nowhere to pick up meth we sell to the vampires, and run it back to the shop without getting busted with enough shit to put me away for life on that alone. Like there's a fella name out, but Chris sent me to get the mortal sin amount. And on the way there, of course, the fact that I'm hauling an ungodly amount of cash to pay for it with. Hey, where's Johnny? One of the cartel guys asks me when he sees me get out of the van. He ain't doing too good right now, so I'm filling in for him today. I explain. I got the money if you got the crack. I had opening the bag to show them the cash. What the fuck happened to the van? Another of them asks, noticing the crumbled metal siding. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Anyway, we're doing this or not. I've been filling in for Johnny all day and the guy works like a machine. I just want to get his shit done and go home. I asked him, tossing the duffel bag at their feet. Johnny or not, money's all here. The first guy says before getting in his car and driving off with the rest of them, revealing several plastic tubs that were sitting in the stacks behind it. I can't believe they ain't even gonna help me. I grunt as I have the tubs into the back of the van. After that, I sat out back to the shop, drugs in tow and thinking I was finally closing in on finishing out for the day. But after dragging all the tubs from the van back to the store and the room myself, Chris comes up and says to me, Guess what? Got a job for you that's actually right down your particular alley. Which is... I hit. And it ain't gonna be easy either. I'm already not liking the way this sounds. I huff, still tired from the rest of the day. What's the problem? Why can't you do this one? 
Hey, calm down. This is what you do best, ain't it? Even... Even Mark said he didn't think you'd be able to pull off that last one. He actually told me he was pretty impressed. Not just that you pulled it off, but I got away clean, too. So if you could do that, you should be able to figure this one out. I even got the guy who can fudge the paperwork and make everything push through a lot faster. Paperwork? So what the hell do I gotta do that involves paperwork? Look, I just need you to go in and see what the security situation is. And tell Madison a few days later as we both watch the Egyptian consulate in the distance. Chris already got you an appointment with your fake papers. Says here the fake name is... Mona Lisa Vito. Fucking Christ, I groan. And I'm Vincent Gambini. Smart ass. What am I gonna say when I just walk in, turn around and leave? She asked me nervously. Just pretend to get a phone call and act like something important came up. Have you ever seen any movie ever? Just go so we can get this over with, I says, shoving her out into the open. Building is kind of scary from the outside, though. I hear quietly once she gets too far to hear me. A few minutes later, she comes jogging back, almost shaking, and ducks into the car where I've been waiting. That was terrifying, she said as she heaved, trying to catch her breath. And what do you see? I questioned her. Oh, right. They got one of those walk-through metal detectors, and they got a guy with one of those metal detector hand wand thingies right after that. She realized to me. And cameras everywhere. You sure the first one was just a metal detector, not an x-ray machine? This lug nut you snuck into my pocket set it off and scared the shit out of me. She said, throwing the piece of metal at me. All right, I think I can work with this. What you gotta do anyway? What's in there? I gotta whack some guy from Egypt who's been hiding out in there. Chris says he's been trafficking paranormals from the area out of the country and bunkering down in there. Apparently someone ain't too happy about that and put a hit on his ass. And that's how we found out about it. You mean you're gonna kill the guy? She says as she gets situated in the scene. Yeah, got a problem with that? No, he sounds like a real asshole. She answers as she gets her seatbelt back into place. What's all that shit? Madison asks a few days later as I set a package from the mail on the workbench. It's from a supplier for knife making stuff? What good's a knife gonna do ya? They got two different metal detectors in here. I'm not making it out of metal. It tells her as I pull the slab of black material out of the box. I'm using this. I add as I hand it over to her. What's this? It's called G10. They usually use it for the handles, but it's so strong you can make something pretty sturdy and sharp out of it. Oh, you mean like carbon fiber? No, no. Carbon fiber can get by the walkthrough detector, but the one would pick it up. This stuff? I says, giving it a few knocks on the counter. Those ones don't catch G10. Now, hand me the skill saw and a few of those cartridge blades for cutting ceramic over there. And cover your face. The dust from this shit can kill you if you ain't too careful. It's real bad if it gets into your eyes, too. Well, it ain't pretty, but it should do. He says, looking it over once I finish wrapping the rubber electrical tape around it, sharpening the edge. Alright, go get Chris my appointment and set it up so I can wrap this up. I tell Madison. Yeah, sure. But what the hell's wrong with your legs? What? Nothing. I'm getting used to walking different than I normally do. Just hiding your face ain't enough. They can catch you off with the way you walk, too. I've seen cases that use footage of someone's walk as evidence. I answered as I work, giving myself a slight limp and not swinging my arms as much. This is some sensitive shit. You fuck with an embassy, you fuck with the embassy's whole country. So it's another few days later and I'm standing across the street looking at the embassy building. Working up the nerve to go in, wishing I didn't have to wear the same stupid clothes from the promise table thing. And then out of nowhere, some broad comes walking up to me in an even dumber outfit than mine and says, Hi there, do you mind if I ask you a few questions real fast? Um, actually I do, I'm kind of busy r- Great, first can I ask your pronouns? She suddenly asks over me, My pr- Hell, I don't know too many. 
I failed English just like every other subject lady. Now fuck off! I said as I shove it to the side and make my way over to the building before she drew too much attention to me. No, I didn't mean that, I just wanted to- <clears throat> She mumbled as I put my hand over her face and shoved her away again, but she just kept following me, so I had to improvise. Oh shit, I hope this works. <clears throat> I coughed, clearing my throat getting into my fake walk. Excuse me, excuse me. I shouted the guards at the gate in the most non-New Yorker, blue blood, Ivy League bullshit voice I could manage. I have an appointment in the consulate and this woman is harassing me. And somehow, I guess in all the confusion, it worked. They opened the gate and let me jog right through and stopped her in her tracks. We're sorry about that, sir. One of the, I'm assuming, Egyptian guards says to me as I pass by. And then I finally get to the entrance of the building and walk inside. A moment of truth. There I was, staring down the walk-through metal detector. So I undo my belt buckle, put it in the little tray, and walk through. Silence. Here's your belt, sir. Would you mind showing me your documents, please? The guy at the end of the setup asks me as he hands me the belt, and the other guy starts wanting me down. Yeah, here you go. I says to him and hand him a fake ID and paperwork. Mr. Vincent Gambini? He asks, looking over the papers. Uh, yeah. That's me. Apparently. And here you are. He says to me as he looks over the screen of his tablet. Your meeting should be held upstairs and three rooms down in about ten minutes. He adds, handing me my papers back. Thank you very much. I says to him in the ridiculous voice with a small nod, as I adjust the reading glasses I bought just before I got here. The fake mustache I was wearing started to tickle my nose. Okay, if I was a paranormal trafficking shit basket, where would I be hiding? I ask myself as I snoop around the joint and look at the photo the guy Chris gave me. Ah, great. I'm gonna have to look through every single fuck in one of these rooms just to find this asshole, aren't I? And then someone bumps into my shoulder. Oh, so sorry. The guy says as he passes by, looking down at the screen of his phone. Fuck me running, that's the guy. I say under my breath as he keeps walking down the hall like I wasn't even there. Well, shit. Can't just kill the bastard in the middle of the hall with all these cameras everywhere. So I decided to figure out where he was headed and followed him first. After a little while, he settled down in the sitting area and opened his laptop to do something on it. Of course he'd pick a room with a camera, I groaned. Once I was sure where he was, I looked around real quick to find a room without any. And after I found a good one, I go running back to where the guy is, making sure to keep a fake walk and voice going. Oh hey, it's you, thank goodness. I shout as I run up to him. There's a gentleman looking for you. He told me if I saw you to bring you straight to him. I think he said something about a possible extradition? I don't know. That sounds important, though. What? Are you serious? The guy shouts back at me. Where is he? This way, I think. I tell him, waving at him to follow me as I do a goofy-ass trot down the hall. Once I get right to the room, I stick my head in and fake talking to someone. I found him. This way, this way. I head looking back down the hall and opening the door for the guy to run in. Hey, nobody's in here. And the guy says once he gets a chance to look around, giving me just enough time to slip my rubber gloves on. I couldn't afford to let him turn around. The second he realized what I was about to do, he'd start fighting back, and that just makes everything that much harder. And if he slips away, I'm screwed. So I reach around with my left hand and grab his chin to keep his neck from turning, or screaming and I jam the tip of the blade into the left side of his neck and drag it across the other side, as hard as I can. By then, he already started to struggle, but it was too late. His whole windpipe and at least one of his arteries was cut. He was trying to scream, and that's how I could tell. I could hear the gurgling sound of the blood getting sucked in and out of his neck before the air could reach his mouth. So I just held on until he stopped moving. Once he was still... I took the gloves off and made sure I didn't have any blood anywhere else. When I was done, I took a second to catch my breath and get my fake walk back before I stepped back out into the hall and put my phone up to my ear. Glad that unlike the US Embassy, they let you bring your phone into this one. 
No, it's fine. I'll just have to reschedule. I need to be there for this. Just breathe, honey. I say with a little urgency in the snooty voice as I jog past the guards at the entrance and out the door. I'm sorry, fellas, but if they ask, my wife's pregnant, and she just went into labor a month before we were expecting. I'm so sorry to be a bother, I really am. I was actually impressed that I was able to think of an excuse on the fly good enough to let me run once I left instead of walk, so I could get as far away and as fast as possible before they found the body. I can't believe I pulled that shit off. I sigh. About a second before I hear the police sirens in the distance. Well, shit. That was quick. Time to lose this shit. He says I tossed the glasses and fake mustache into a public trash can and skipped back off to where I'd left the van a few blocks away. Hey, got him. I tell Chris after I get my burner phone out of the glove box. Really? No shit? Already? He asks from the other end. Yeah, why is that so hard to believe? I told you guys I was good at what I do. I ask him back. Fair enough, I guess. Just get back here and you get your cut of the cash. Hey, you good? You sound kind of off. I ask him when I notice he didn't sound at all there. I'm fine. Mind your business. He answers before hanging up. Mildly offended, I put the phone in the other seat and start the van to make my way back to the shop. I catch myself starting to relax once I turn into Broadway and see a sign of my favorite restaurant down the road. I'm gonna get my cash, and then I'm gonna eat Mexican food till I puke. Or oh, shit myself. Whichever comes first. I tell myself, right before my phone rings. Ah oh, shit, what the hell does Madison want? Louie? Louie, I need your help. She whispers sharply into my ear when I answer. Uh, why are you whispering? What the hell's wrong now? I was out making a drop when I saw one of those angel guys, so I followed them, because they looked like they were up to something. And they went into some kind of weird building, and now I'm stuck in the building and I can't get out. I need help. She explains in a hurry. Fuck. All right, all right. Just send me your location. I'll be there as soon as I can. A few seconds after I hang up, I get the location and head straight there. On the way, I call Chris and tell him to get Johnny and Muscles rounded up and Abigail if he can, and to get where I'm going. Since I didn't know how much trouble she might be in, I went on ahead of everyone and hoped everything would work out, and we didn't just both end up dying. I just wanted some goddamn enchiladas, I mumbled to myself as I run another red light and rifle through the damn glove box for my pistols, and my pocket knife to set them on the passenger seat next to me. Madison, I'm, I'm outside. Where the fuck are you? I ask through the phone once I pull into the lot across the street. I'm in some kind of room with a bunch of cages. There's like weird animals in them. I think they might be paranormals. And the room before that has some kind of those green people in cages too. What? Wh what? I start to ask. And then the pieces start to fall into place. That's when I had a pretty good idea who ordered the hit. Okay, Madison, just try to hang tight. I'm gonna try something. You remember the way out? Yeah, there's just too many of those angels to slip past. All right, stay where you are, and once you hear the commotion, give it a second, and then haul ass outside. I tells her as I stuff the snub nose in my pocket and grab a lighter out of the toolbox in the back. Once I had everything, I ran around to the other side and picked up a random parked car close to the building. Don't try this next part at home, kids. Once I pick the car, an older one so you can just open the cover of the gas cap from the outside. I twist the cap off and wad my necktie into the opening. Once it's in there, I light the end of the tie and take off to another car a little further back. And do the same thing with another piece of my shirt. Let the first one cook for a few more seconds, then light the piece of shirt and take back off to the van. Boom! The can goes up in flames once the fumes of the gas tank finally hit the burning tie. Seconds later, I can hear the chaos as the angels start pouring out of the building to investigate the explosion. Boom! The second one goes up as I hear the screams as several of them catch on fire. Not long after, I hear my phone ring. What the fuck was that? Madison yells at me and she makes a break through the place trying to get outside. Probably domestic terrorism if it ends up in court. So move your ass so we can get the fuck out of here! I yell back at her. I'm parked across the street. Everyone should be here soon to back us up. 
I add, making sure she knows where to go when she's out, and peeking around the corner to see what's going on. Don't you move! I hear a voice shout from behind me as I was putting my phone back in my pocket. Hands over, I can see him, and get down on the ground! Yep, that's definitely a cop, I sighed to myself. There goes them not seeing my face. And I really don't want to kill one of those guys today. They didn't hang on to that shit. And then, against all odds, who comes running around the corner right into me? Abigail? No fucking way. Where the hell did she come from? I think to myself. But then an idea hits me as I glare down at her. An evil grin cracking across my face. It didn't take her clever ass long to see exactly what I was thinking, because as soon as she saw that smile, she says, Don't you do it. I swear to God, if you- Grab the gun or I'll make you wear fucking brains! I yell, snatching her up and hold her in between me and the cop, just high enough to where she can't see my whole face, my pistol pressed against the head. Deja vu, right? I whisper in her ears as I start to feel her tremble with rage. You are going to pay for this. She whispers back without moving her mouth. Turn the other way and get down on the ground, asshole! I'm not fucking around! I'll blow this kid's head off! I keep yelling at the cop. Now hands on your head and cross your feet behind you! I've been arrested before, I know how this shit's done! Once they're on the knees, I hear the front entrance of the door of the building slam open, and Madison barrels out into the street and towards the van. But by that time, the Angels started to get wise to me and started rounding the building and were heading straight for me and Abigail. Getting fed up with everything? She pushes herself off me and runs over to the cop, stomping on one of their ankles, making a horrible cracking noise before she pops them with a hook to the head and puts them out cold. What the fuck was that for? I ask as she runs back over to me. Saddle down. He'll probably get a medal for that. We need to worry about them now, she says, directing me to the torrent of angels stampeding towards us. So I aim my pistol in their general direction and empty it. Well, that did fuck all, I shout over to Abigail, who was starting hurling random objects towards them at supersonic speeds. But she wasn't making much more of a dent than I did. Madison was only about halfway between the building and the van when they noticed her too. Bitch, move yes! I scream at her as some of the angels changed direction to make a play for her. She's not gonna make it! I don't know if she's gonna make it! I yell at Abigail as she changed targets and started peppering the ones heading for Madison with loose pieces of concrete and gravel. But it didn't do much of nothing. Just when I was ready to take off and meet her halfway, Chris, Johnny, and Muscles come sliding around the opposite corner in Chris's car, Johnny hanging out the window with his rifle and putting rounds into the front of the mob, finally slowing them down a little before I see him chuck something into the middle of them. Boom! An explosion goes off, sending debris and body parts up into the air. That finally makes the whole group falter for just long enough for me, Madison, and Abigail to pile into the van and speed off. Holy shit, I think I actually pissed my pants! I scream as we fly past traffic on the way back to the shop. And where did Johnny find a grenade? I don't think they care about the not hurting us thing. Madison gasps from the back seat as Abigail glares at me from the passenger seat. What? What? Stop using me as a prop. She growls at me. Eh, you'll live, I say dismissively with a wave of my hand. Couldn't have done without you. You really saved my ass this time. Hmm. She groaned, turning her head to look out the window. After a while, we were finally all back at the shop and gathering around the table. And I remember what I had thought of earlier. So I explained to them what I think is going on. So... You saying you think they put a hit out on this guy using a fake identity? And they plan on using the commotion following his death to swipe his whole paranormal trafficking operation. Which Madison, being the reckless dumbass that she is, just happened to stumble across right as it was happening. Chris asked once I'm done explaining everything. It seems about right, yeah. If that's true, then that means they're making some serious plays for this area that span all the way out to other countries. And they used us to do it. Chris says as he pulls the chair out and sits down. They think they can fuck with us any which way now that Mark's gone? They're about to learn the hard way that ain't how shit works around here. Just because... Just because Mark ain't around no more don't mean you can just... You okay, boss? 
I ask as he suddenly stops talking. Look, there's a lot on my goddamn plate right now, and I don't know if I'm ready to handle running this shit. Yo, I think I know what's going on. Madison suddenly speaks up. We all bet out of shape about Mark dying, and you're all keeping all that shit bottled up like Neanderthals you are, ain't you? What? No! All of us, even Abigail, say at once. Yeah, that's what I thought. Look, how's about we all take the rest of the night off and just, you know, give old Mark a proper goodbye like he deserves? Madison suggests. You got a place you like to go? So we all took her advice and closed up the shop. I asked what we were supposed to do about all the paranormal still in cages, but he told me that ain't our department, and that he already made the call to the right people who sought that kind of business out. That those angels had a lot of black and gold in their immediate future, which I assumed to mean that those hotel people were going to be doing some raining down on that ungodly hellfire Mark talked about. Scorched earth was the term Chris used. An hour or so later, we were all at the bar. What can I get you guys? The guy asked once we were all sat down at our favorite table towards the back wall. Johnny got his usual piss water. Chris got a Jack and Coke. Madison ordered a Bloody Mary. I asked for a scotch. And then there was Abigail to help things go smoothly as always. I love Margarita. She sat like it was nothing. Oh, little lady, I don't think you're old enough for that kind of drink. How about a root beer? We all watched in terror at the impending disaster that was about to unfold at our table. And sure enough, she reaches over, grabs the waiter's hand, and starts to squeeze. It took about half a second before we saw the shock and alarm in his face. Hey! Ow! 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 Let go! Ah! Shh! Hush, hush, she tells him as she pulls him down close to her. Louie, knife please. She asks me from across the table, so I pull out my pocket knife and slide it across the table to her, which she immediately opens and nails her own fucking hand to the table with it. Oh my god! The waiter cries. It just audible over the ambient racket of the rest of the bar. What's wrong with you? Think for a second. If I'm willing to do this to myself just to make a point, what might I possibly be willing to do to say you or your wife or your children? Hmm? She says to the guy, and as he looks down at her in terror, I actually kind of feel bad for the poor schmuck. Is all this really worth not bringing me my drink? I'm so sorry, ma'am. I'll bring you that right away. He tells her, almost on the verge of tears. Remind me to leave him a good tip. Abigail says to me as she wrenches my knife out of the table and slides it back over to me, after thoroughly wiping her blood off it and tucking the contaminated napkin into a pocket. Holy shit, what a day. Chris barks as we all stagger and stumble out of the bar several hours later, all absolutely pissed drunk. Especially Abigail, who I'd lost count of how many margaritas she'd knocked back since we'd been there. We finally had to leave when she made the declaration that if she started to puke, she was going to spin her head all the way around like the exorcist before it comes out. So we thought it'd probably be best to bail out before that happened. As we all wandered down the sidewalk, I hear Madison making a call. Hey. Hey, Rissa. Hey, where do I live again? <laughs> Mason, Madison, Madison's drunk. <laughs> Abigail hiccups at her from beside me. All right, I'm heading home. Johnny says as he finally gives up and heads off in a different direction. Yeah, me too. Chris says as he heads off his own direction. Had a good time, guys. See you tomorrow. He adds with a wave. I'm gonna wait here. Riss is coming to get me, Madison says as she plops down on the bench. See you guys later. Uh, yeah, no, we're not just leaving your drunk ass on the sidewalk. There's all kind of creeps out this time of night. Like Chris and Johnny. 
I just asked her as I sit down next to her to wait. Pulling Abigail over with me so she can sit too. As we sit there, I watch Madison drunkenly play around with her derby to pass the time, betting against myself whether or not she ends up puking in it. And as I watch, I feel Abigail's hand rest against my shoulder. She starts to fall asleep. Hey, no, no, hey, wake up, I say, trying to nudge her awake with my arm. I'm not carrying you home. I don't even know where you live. But it was already over. She was out, and even by the time Madison's girlfriend had already came and picked her up, she was still not budging. Hey, God damn it! All right. Fine, I'll take you home. The evil bitch. Where am I going? I asked her frustrated to no end. Shop. What? No, I'm not taking you to the shop. You need rest. Where's your house? Shop. Son of a bitch, you ain't going back to the shop tonight because I'm not carrying you there. Now where do you live? I bark at her one more time. Shut Oh, fuck me! I interrupted before she could say it. If you puke on me, I'm leaving you in the middle of the road, I swear to God. I mumble, halfway back to my apartment with her on my back. You're gonna make me a social pariah, I just know it. Wait, am I using that right, pariah? Paria? No idea. Definitely still drunk. Once I finally get back to the apartment and get the door open and keep the damn goblin from running out the door, I lay Abigail down on the bed and pull the blanket over her. You know, she starts to grow on you once you get past the eight or so letters of evil and spite. He says to the goblin as he crawls up next to her feet, that took me about five minutes to unlace the ridiculous boots she was wearing all the time. But I ain't gotta tell you that, fucking traitor. So once I get that situated, I decided to take a shower, resigning myself to the recliner for the night. Just as I step out of the bathroom and sink down into my favorite easy chair, bzz, 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 I hear my regular phone go off from a text. So I pick it up and read it before letting myself finally pass out and see... It's from Jose. I'm not 100% sure yet, but I have a good idea of who killed Mark. It looks like it... And then the message suddenly cuts off. Like he was trying to send it in a hurry and didn't get to finish. So close. I sigh to myself as I stand up to wake Abigail. Before I get to where I hear it in the distance, the deep boom of a massive explosion that shook the entire apartment building and made the lights flicker off for a second. Uh, what was that? Abigail asks as she rolls over in the bed. Hey, you need to wake up. I think something really bad just happened. 